Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming here. Another session of the Solar Decathlon here in Wuppertal. We will start in five minutes with the program. So you can look forward to a very interesting and a hopeful, very inspiring afternoon of two organizations here in Germany which collaborated and have also brought some very interesting and fascinating speakers here. And this will give you a, another chance to learn more about sustainable architecture. And due to the fact that those wonderful buildings have actually an interior space, it's really worth to acknowledge this work, what has been done by these international teams of students. And another aspect is, of course, that you would like to see what's there. And of course, you need light for this. You have perceived probably, if you have spent the last weeks here on the Solar Decathlon campus, that we enjoyed a wonderful time with a lot of sunshine. Sometimes sunlight is very powerful, but so powerful that it's more warm than you can actually enjoy it. So it was a major challenge for all the teams here to figure out how to balance how much daylight do we get into the building and how can we reduce it so it's actually very nice to stay in the building, to enjoy, and maybe in the future actually to live in these buildings without wearing the sunglasses because it's so glary inside there. So for that reason, a couple of teams have thought about this issue about how to keep specific aspects at a specific time out there from the daylight. But for the interior um, environment we see, it's quite important to think also about the time after sunset. So due to the fact that these buildings were designed actually as a living building, that you can actually live there, need also an additional maybe electrical infrastructure. And it's not only like in older times where you had this conventional switch on and off, times have changed. Probably you have seen many tablets on the wall where you can select predefined scenes. If this is too much for you, don't problem. They can be automized. So you can just wake up and you get the right light at the right time. And then if you think of maybe taking a shower and you think the shower yesterday was pretty good, but for the afternoon I, diff uh, I need a different setting. We can see student groups which have thought about this moment of having a shower of light with different settings. So when we discovered the different interior architectures and the different lighting designs, the idea came up by the two G associations here in Germany. And you can see we have on the one side here the German Association for Interior Architecture and we have the Lighting Association in Germany that they said the students have developed so many interesting concepts regarding, regarding performance, high-tech, to evaluate electricity and other aspects. And there's these two additional elements, interior architecture and lighting. And it's worth to acknowledge the work. And therefore, those two associations started a collaboration and thought, we would like to set up an afternoon session to promote the work of good interior and lighting design. And this is what I would like to present to you here in the afternoon. My name is Thomas Schilker. I've been teaching here at the Wuppertal University with Carsten Faust for the last years. Ask my students also to evaluate the different design concepts here. I'm working for the lighting manufacturer Erco, which is about one hour away from here, doing some research. And if you're a reader of the architecture blog Arc Daily, you could find a lighting column there, which I have published there. So for this afternoon, I would like to give you an overview about the program. We will have in the afternoon um, four different talks about in two um, um, dimensions. So one is about interior architecture and the other one is about um, lighting design. But I could imagine that you are curious and asking yourself, what is actually the motivation of an association to promote this work and how have they worked already on sustainable design techniques. For this reason, I would like to invite 
Thomas Röhmheld from the Lighting Association, and Jutta Hillen and Daniela sachs rollmann from the BDIA um, here to the stage, and that they could explain to you a little bit more what you can learn from those associations. And if you are a student, it might be very interesting what you can learn there. If you are a professional, I think it's worth to listen to them, and maybe you can benefit from their interesting ideas. So please give a warm welcome to the team which has already also worked in um, the its design jury. It's Thomas Röhmheld, Jutta Hillen, and Daniela sachs rollmann Thank you very much. Hallo, ja, ja ähm, das Mikrofon ist eingeschaltet, die Veranstaltung heute soll auf Englisch stattfinden und ich denke, das wird auch für Sie kein Problem sein. Der Veranstalter hat uns eben angesprochen, ob wir nicht auch Deutsch sprechen können. Das können wir auch, aber wir haben natürlich sehr viele Studierende und Gäste, denen es leichter fällt, wenn wir auf Englisch sprechen. So, mein Name ist Thomas Röhmhild, ich bin der Vorsitzende der Lichttechnischen Gesellschaft auf der, an der, auf der einen Seite und deswegen bin ich hier. Ich bin aber auch der, äh, ein, ein Lehrender von der Hochschule in Wismar. So, my name is Thomas Röhmhild, I'm the head of the Lighting um, Technology Association of Germany and I'm also teaching at the Hochschule Wismar. The Lighting Technology um, Association, this sounds a lot about technology, but we were also thinking that our association, that we can take this wording also for the words light, technology and design, Licht, Technik und Gestaltung. The Lighting Technology Association is now more existing now more than 100 years so it is a very old association and i would like to say it is the lighting association in germany and more and more all the light uh, all the people who are working in light technology and all the people who are working in lighting design are coming together in this association to work for a better lighting in the future. Our organization, um, I think it is good to introduce it a little bit because not so many people here might know about this. Our organization <clears throat> is working with the Technical Scientific Board and there we have also a department of light and architecture but also a lot of technical questions about lighting. And then we have expert committees where everyone who is interested can work with other experts to um, develop and to clarify tasks and open questions. And there we have the interior lighting, the outdoor lighting, the day lighting and the lighting design. For us, it is really a pleasure to be here because this connection of light and architecture is more and more important. We say that light is the mediator between the person and the space, so it is the core, already Corbusier was mentioning that it is the core of the architecture to have a good lighting, but um, um, our association is stepping more and more forward into the fields of architecture. And that's why we are so happy that we are part in this event and that we can also have two speeches and a prize for the best lighting situation. Yeah, um, that's all about the Lighting Association and uh, I think I would like to hand over to you. I don't know who starts. I will start. Okay. 
Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the Decathlon Solar 21-22. My name is Daniela sachs rollmann I'm the chairwoman of BDA Rheinland-Pfalz-Saarland and a self-employed um, interior, uh, self interior architect. <laughs> Hello, same for me. I'm also self-employed interior architect, and I'm here for the um, BDA. I'm chairwoman of the Landesverband Nordrhein-Westfalen. Welcome. The BDA, Bund Deutscher Innenarchitekten, is presenting the Human-Centered Interior Architecture Award for the first time today at Decathlon Solar. We are very much looking forward to the award ceremony tonight at 6 o'clock in this hall. We would like to briefly introduce the BDA to you. Okay. Um. Also es steht auch da, ich mache das kurz auch auf Deutsch, denn den BDA gibt es seit 70 Jahren. Ähm, wir, wir ähm, ich muss es gerade hier übersetzen aus dem Englischen, ähm, wir setzen uns ein für die Interessen der Innenarchitekten. Ähm, wir bieten sehr vieles an in unserem Verband für die Innenarchitekten, für die Weiterbildung zum Beispiel oder eben, wir machen gemeinsame Events, wir, wir schauen uns äh, Showrooms an, informieren uns über Materialien, über rechtliche Bedingungen ähm, und sind halt äh, daher sehr wichtig für die ähm, innenarchitektonische Kultur in Deutschland. For 70 years we have been working in cooperation with associations and institutions to promote the interests of interior architects. We bundle activities and topics for interior architecture as a part of building culture. The BD up promotes and consolidates the profession and the professional practice of interior architect. The BDA was founded in 1952 in Detmold, in Nordrhein-Westfalia. As the professional representation of its members, it advocates, sorry, I have to <laughs> flip over, their interest in public and vis-a-vis -vis business and politics. In addition, the BDR works uh, on a European and an international level. We accompany the education of the new generation and engage ourselves in the professional further education. The BDR sees itself as a platform for information, communication and exchange of experience and offers its members a wide range of services. The most important goals of the BDR are to raise and secure the reputation of the profession, to promote the quality of interior architecture and construction in its responsibility towards society, to promote the cooperation of all those involved in the planning process, in particular of the three disciplines of architecture. The BDR supports the objective determination of the best solution in free intellectual competition to support the discussion and the development in the profession of interior design and especially in the direction of education and training. You can learn more about our work in our image film, with, we, we, which is unfortunately only in German. <laughs> But we can maybe talk about it. Also ich persönlich bin beim BDA, weil mir es wichtig ist, auch über den Teller ranzuschauen. Weil du viele andere Gleichgesinnte triffst und wir uns gegenseitig helfen. Super Netzwerk, ähm, tolle Leute, prima Menschen. 100% Innenarchitektur. Dieses geballte Wissen ähm, von vielen Köpfen. Es gibt auch Halt, weil man hat ja einen Verband hinter sich, man ist nicht alleine. Ja, Kontakte und zwar in sämtliche Richtungen, nicht nur zu Berufskollegen, sondern auch zu, zu Förderkreismitgliedern, ähm, zu, zu Herstellern, Produkten, mit denen man nicht alltäglich zu tun hat. Die Hälfte der Mitglieder der Architektenkammer sind Angestellte. Der BDA ist eine starke Stimme für die Angestellten. Also BDA-Fortbildungen, ähm, Veranstaltungen, Netzwerktreffen, Afterwork-Veranstaltungen. Ja, also wenn man selber was bewirken möchte, dann ist natürlich die Möglichkeit, im BDA aktiv zu werden und äh, selber sich einzubringen. 
Es gibt tolle Auszeichnungen für junge Studenten. Es gibt für Büros äh, tolle Möglichkeiten, sich zu präsentieren, sowohl in Veranstaltungen wie auch bei Wettbewerben. Jeder ist willkommen. Du kannst immer mitmachen beim Projekt zu jeder Zeit. Es ist einfach super spannend, dass äh, so viel Kreativität auf einem Haufen ist. Ich, denke, ich treffe die Menschen, die dieselbe Leidenschaft haben wie ich. Der BDIA steht für Berufspolitik, der BDIA steht für Netzwerke. Berufspolitik ist im Moment sehr wichtig für uns Innenarchitekten, weil sich der Beruf der Innenarchitekten sehr wandelt über die verschiedenen neuen Berufsfelder, über BIM, über Internet, über Nutzung von Daten. Also wir stehen dafür, dass die Innenarchitekten zu ihrem Recht kommen und wir vertreten alle Innenarchitekten in den Architektenkammern. We are pleased. We are pleased to announce that BDR is part of the Solar Decathlon 2122 and can present the Human Centered Interior Architecture Award tonight. Interior architecture is an important part of architecture. The BDR is proud to be able to present this award. Der Deutsche Architektentag ist das Treffen der deutschen Architekten. Okay. <laughs> the BDI is proud to be able to present this award today at the Solar Decathlon. The members of the jury of the award have seen great examples of interior architecture during, on, during our tour of the projects. We will award the best three projects tonight. We cordially invite you to the award ceremony. For the uh, support, the BDI I'd uh, like to thank our marketing partners, Graphisoft, Forbo, Richlight, Ma, ATN, ATN. We would also like to thank the organizers of Solar Decathlon and Lichttechnische Gesellschaft for the preparation of our joint event. Enjoy our presentations, the subsequent panel discussion and the award ceremony in the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And now I would like to um, tell you a little bit more about the afternoon program, especially with the next lecture which are coming up. So at first you will think, see something about, and here's something very interesting about daylight. This will be followed by um, some information about how you can work with a small little light box to understand lighting in a better way and I'm looking forward to this lecture because my students had a similar task in the last course. Then I will give a presentation about changing needs in lighting design, talking about system thinking. And finally, it's time to talk about sustainable architecture and future living. I think this will be a wonderful connection to the living lab, which we will have seen here in the last day and which will stay there for, for another couple of years. And so let's start with the first speaker. The first speaker will be Judith Gross, and I was very glad that I could spend and learn more about her work yesterday when she was also part of the lighting jury. And she will talk about the understanding of daylight as a design parameter in architecture. So whenever you think and plan something like an atrium or facade design, the question arises how to deal with daylight and even underground spaces.
can you fill flood them with daylight and what you have to be taken care of. It will be very interesting also to understand what she thinks about research and teaching. Her background is in architecture. She studied architecture at the Stuttgart University, and then later on she added a master's degree in lighting design at the Badenbach Lighting Academy in Austria. And this was so fascinating for her that she has stayed many years with the Badenbach Lichtlabor, and she worked there on conducting research in different ways, thought about application studies, so not only to speak about the theory of daylight and perception, but really to think how can you explain them and feel and experience these spaces. She is head of the Badenbach Academy, so really a lot into the teaching of light, and therefore she is also very committed to the topic of daylight. Please give a very warm welcome to Judith Gross and Understanding Daylight as a Design Parameter. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thomas, thank you for the kind introduction. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to open this lecture series. And as you already mentioned, the topic is building with daylight. Understanding daylight as a design parameter, this is the topic of my lecture. I'm going to present lighting design concepts, but I will also show how the topic of building with daylight affects the areas of research and development. Some facts about our company. Where do I work? <laughs> um, Badenbach is an independent lighting designer situated in Innsbruck. Um, we offer lighting design as a service. Our company was founded in 1976 by Professor Badenbach, a very charismatic person. He's 92 years old this year. We have got 100 employees, 45 working in the lighting design department. We completed more than 100,000 projects worldwide and we are dedicated to artificial lighting design. But I have to mention we understand lighting design as the planning of daylight in the first step. You already introduced me. I'm an architect and lighting designer. I've been working for Badenbach for 16 years now in different departments, such as lighting design research and development, and I'm the head of Badenbach Academy. Um, yes, our office is situated in the mountains with this impressive view. It's a really idyllic place, and I'm lucky enough to work there. This is our founder practicing yoga. And the quote says, not from the luminaire to the overall ambience, but from the desired effect to the lighting concept using the findings in perception, perception psychology. So the quote emphasizes that we start lighting design with the human being and its needs. Lighting design is based on perception psychology. This is important for us. We have different departments, lighting design, you are familiar with this, daylighting and artificial lighting design. We do competition support, um, model construction, simulation and so on. But the unique feature of our company is that we have our own research and development department. And we do research on the effect of light on the human being. For example, light for the aging society, light and material. And the findings of the research, we can directly apply it in our lighting design concepts. Yes, and the academy is also very special, an in-house academy dedicated to daylighting workshops. Yes, once again, our different, um, 
our spectrum, the different pillars of our company. Um, yes, something special is also the world of light. It's our exhibition and you are welcome if you pass by Innsbruck. Many people go to the south via the Brenner route. So um, stop and have a look at our exhibition space. It covers approximately 800 square meters. And in this exhibition, in this showroom, you can find topics as light and health, building with daylight, light and color. And we have one-to-one um, -one light experience rooms. Of course, um, yeah, we, you can see it in the next uh, auditorium. Um, many, many models, um, exhibition cubes, displays, and interactive models. In our conference room, the so-called white room, we have tunable white light, biodynamic lighting, but additionally, we have a light shower implemented. So it's a light therapy booth to activate people in the morning hours during a meeting, a discussion. We can produce high vertical illuminances and a cold white spectrum to activate people during the conference. The unique feature of our company is the artificial sky. It's a measurement device, a measurement tool, but also a visualization tool. We work with scaled models, bring them into the sky, and the sky can reproduce standardized sky models for example, the overcast sky, the sunny sky, or the sunny situation. There's a mobile sun. You can see it on the bottom, the right side, with narrow beam optics. And we can study the sun paths and the impact on the building. Very, yeah, you get an impression of the effect of light. You can change materials and this. A useful tool in our lighting design process. We work with students, we work with architects, with clients. Um, some further impressions. Building with daylight. There are a variety of moods, of ambiences, natural ambiences, and it's hard to imitate them. Even in our artificial sky, we are not able to do this. Um, they immediately, immediately affect us. And it's also hard to talk about light. <laughs> this is the problem, to communicate light. Diffuse light, directed light, but there is a qualitative and a quantitative dimension of light. We can measure some aspects, for example, the spectrum of daylight, the illuminance. But be aware of the fact that is just part of the truth <laughs> or part of the beauty. Light, not only daylight, light in general acts on three levels, visual, Bi biological and atmospheric. We have to consider this. So, but nowadays, human beings spend 90% of their time indoors, I claim, in a state of artificial twilight, in dark rooms. In the diagram, you can see the small red columns these are the illuminances that the standards recommend for a working place in our office, 500 lux, static light normally. Oh. And the gray and orange columns, these are outdoor situations. The gray columns indicate the illuminances in the course of the day for a cloudy sky and the orange for a sunny day, reaching up at 12 o'clock to 70,000, 100,000 lux. So very often we do not get this impulse of the daylight, but we need it to synchronize our inner clock to stabilize the circadian rhythm. 
and we work in this dark <laughs> offices and this is a problem so this is my mission i'm an advocate for daylighting to bring daylight into the buildings when we start a project at the beginning we analyze the building task be it the integration of light flooded atriums the optimization of the facade bringing light into the underground areas but very often these are just corrections, facade corrections. Is this real daylight architecture? I ask myself when I prepared this lecture. It depends um, on the stage we enter the project. If you enter the project at an early stage, discuss with the client and architect, you can influence the project. You have a high impact. You can talk about, about the orientation, the dimension of the openings, the light qualities, you can define them together. But think of all the refurbishment projects. There we have to do a lot of facade corrections and improve the situation. So, I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> Some comments at the bottom. If you start, your design, consider the genius Loki. This is the quality of the place, the spirit. Architecture is a response to the natural condition of each place, to the light and climate conditions. Start with the site analysis. And start with the user requirement and not with the system. This is also what the quote from Mr. Badenbach meant that we start with the human being, its perception. We do not talk about luminaires and daylighting system. This is at the end of the lighting design process when you want to solve the, the problem. Yes. If you are lucky, you can enter the project at an early stage. So let me give you a tour through our projects filling an urban gap, a project in London. Have a look at this site plan. So, Hennigan Peng architects, they won the competition to design the new school of architecture in London for the Greenwich University. It also includes the Department for Landscape Design. Um, it is located in Greenwich Park within the World Heritage Site. What was the challenge? The challenge was to integrate a huge block, a dense structure, a five-story structure, within this historic urban fabric. So what did we do? We started with the site analysis, also sand path analysis, and we organized the site into bands, wide bands. There are the study rooms, the uh, the seminar rooms for the students and the narrow bands they serve to bring light and air into the building. You can see it on the right side. We implemented bands of light into this volume. And here it is the building that we created in the dialogue with the architect and client. The light enters these bands, these courtyards, and goes down. And another feature is that the facade is more closed on the top part, the facade facing the courtyard. You can see it on the right side. It is more closed on the top side and more opened on the bottom. And moreover, we thought about reflecting the panels of the facade in order to guide more direct sunlight into the ground of the building.
So there is a gradual decree of opening in this courtyard facades as one measure of our concept. Here are some impressions of the building flooded with daylight. And another interesting feature, the roof steps down to the existing residential buildings. And there are roof gardens where the landscape architects cultivate plants. And on the right side, you can perceive that it perfectly fits into this urban historic fabric. The architect kept to the initial concept. You can see the concept model and then the ground floor plan. So let's move to Germany. Open the book, the new library in Augsburg. The new public library was planned by Schrammel Architects and he involved Badenbach to handle daylighting and artificial lighting design. The shape of the building is based on a book with a book end and open leaves. Originally, yeah, the task was to create a transparent building, uh, illuminated building from the inside also and from the facade. And originally, the client and the architect, they, the art room should get a huge glass roof. But what did we do? We changed the design, we closed the roof, opened it to the north and implemented light guiding shafts. There are skylights. The skylights are cladded with aluminium mirror facets that reflect the sunlight and they create a vivid pattern in the area of the staircase. It's like a second layer covering architecture, dynamic sunlight, as you can see here, the right side. In the adjacent reading areas, there are no sun patterns. We wanted to create a working light fostering concentration. We worked with light guiding blinds, reflective lamellas integrated in the double skin facade, and they serve as a sun shading system, but they also can guide light a certain amount of light into the depth of the room via this reflective panel on the ceiling. So we dose the sunlight, we use it for lighting. Some details about our skylight. We also integrated artificial light into the shaft. Some impressions and the advantages. We created a building with a high daylight autonomy, with low solar loads and a high user acceptance low energy consumption. So, this was an old project, but I like it very much. Let's move to a current project, a project under construction. Let's move to Frankfurt. In Frankfurt, this high-rise building complex is being created on a former Deutsche Bank site, which was not accessible for the last 45 years. Um, there are two office towers and two residential towers, and the residential towers also include a certain proportion of subsidized, price-reduced apartments. This is what Frankfurt uh, wanted. This should be a new quarter for all. There's also a kindergarten, and there are roof terraces. I can skip to this. The uh, four high-rise buildings are based on a podium and the roofs of the podiums are gardens, public gardens. So what was our task? We did the sun studies. We, yeah, material consultation was extremely important in this project. We wanted to direct sunlight to the central square. This should not be a dark square. So we recommended a reflectance of the facade of 30%. We 
yeah, the, the materials differ in, in reflectance and structure. It's, on the one hand, you have the reflectance, how much light do you guide to the square, and on the other hand, um, how does the material behave? Does it work with directed light or does it diffuse the light? We implemented warm materials on the central square, warm colored sandstone for the human scale to create a comfortable square. We inclined the facades and um, some further impressions how we made our sun analysis. And as I mentioned, the material consultation, which was extremely important. Warmer materials for the residential buildings and colder for the office buildings. So let's move to Garmisch-Partenkirchen, a courtyard without sunlight. There is this existing building complex and there is an internal courtyard. You can see it on the right side. It was not in use. It was totally dark. And the client wanted to use it as a foyer and as a connection space, connecting the different parts of the hospital. So what did we do? We made a daylight study. We used our artificial sky. We also used um, simulation tools. And there were several solutions. We took into account a shed roof, a completely glazed roof, problem of overheating, the problem of the snow lying on the glass roof. And then the decision came in the artificial sky. You can see here. This was convincing a roof where we implemented 49 skylands, skylights that differ in diameter. And you reduce the daylight factor compared to a glazed roof, but it's uh, a high daylight, reflect, ref, uh, daylight factor of 15% and a comfortable space flooded with daylight. You can see that you perceive the blue of the sky, the dynamics of the daylight. We also integrated artificial light into this project. And the snow slides down. <laughs> Additionally, there is a so-called Fresnel cross that avoids glare that we implemented into the skylight. So, the building where I work, the Badenbach office building, represents a piece of daylight architecture. It was designed by the Tyrolean architect Josef Lackner in cooperation with Christian Badenbach in 1989. It has the shape of a spiral, spiral and yeah, the upper part of the spiral has got roof lights, skylights. And here you have the section, which is really interesting. The skylights direct the light into a small shaft. There are aluminum panels that redirect the light to the reflective ceiling and then into the depth of the room. This means in the second row, the employees have enough daylight. There's a really high daylight autonomy in this building. And what happens in the lower part of the building? You can see the ceilings do not touch the facade. They are inclined in order to let the daylight into the depth of the room. This is our solution there, as you can see in the picture. Our principle is the separation of the functions in this building. This is how we call it, because there are parts that are responsible for daylighting and parts um, that uh, are responsible for the connection to the outside. And 
small windows are sufficient for this. You don't need a completely glassed facade to look out. A small hole is sufficient. And above there is the light entry. So this is the principle of this building. And it still works like this. No renovation <laughs> is necessary. Less is more. I'm fast, but I move to the next project. Adidas Arena Herzogen Aurach with Benish Architects. It is a total different approach. Look at the facade. Separation of the function? No, it is a sun shading static louver or grid covering the glass facade. It looks really homogeneous, but the louver reacts on the different orientations. It's not similar in the east and the west and the south and the north. It reacts to the different orientations. We advise the architect concerning yeah, the parametric design, the sun shading, the view to the outside in order to minimize the heat gain, maximum light transmittance. There was also the advice of the perforation to optimize it in order to have the view because some of the elements are perforated. Some further impressions of the building during night time. And we won the Lighting Design Prize, the German Lighting Design Prize in the category Daylight for this building. It is a huge volume. There are integrated atriums, light courts. This is necessary. There are streets and quarters and a, a guiding system, a really complex um, architectural project. We did the material consultation. There are the employees entering. It looks like a stadium and should look like a stadium. And then there are waiting areas for the visitors and we have this material change. It's not a different picture. It's just a change in material in the areas where the people should stay and take a seat. Yes, another impression simple measure to use the ceilings as reflector in order to emphasize the daylight entry into the depth of the room. So the students worked with the topic of residential buildings. Let's have a look at a terraced house with a pay show. The project is called Loft Houses in Kolbermoor, Bavaria. Benish architect planned these residential units and the most prominent feature is the sorry the most prominent feature is the integrated patio in the center of the deep structure it's uh, really a challenge to illuminate ter terraced houses because they are very deep 18 to 20 meters so what do you do <laughs> there are only two facades to, to collect the light. So the patio, it provides solar gains in the winter time, and it is also characterized by enhanced ventilation in the summer time. It is not a light guiding shaft, you can see it in the picture. It's just a simple measure <laughs> to implement this patio in the building and in the kitchen over there, you at least get an impression of daylight. Of course, it's not that much, depending on the outdoor situation, of course, but at least it's not dark. So a very simple project, I would claim. Yes, light from above, light from the roof. The next topic is a research project, the office as a sun catcher. It was a building, or it was a research project in the program Haus der Zukunft some years ago, and our partners were RTP Architects and Wohnfonds Wien. 
The official title is Development of a Light Well for Daylight Transparent, Highly Energy Efficient Multi Story Buildings. The task was to provide daylight in a multi level building using nothing but vertical shafts. The facade is derived from the function of bringing light. The facade, of course, it can have openings for the connection to the outside, but imagine uh, New York, <laughs> you cannot get sight from the, uh, light from the facade, you catch it from the roof. And this is an idea of Mr. Badenbach and, of course, many students um, dedicated themselves to this project. We built a model, we wanted to perceive the atmosphere of such a shaft. And together with the architects, we made a feasibility study. Can this work in reality? The opening of the shaft is equipped with a panel that conducts the light as far down as possible. The courtyard facades internally approximately get the same amount of light, which is then reflected into the various levels of the building via a light shelf or light guiding systems, as you can see in the model. We have light guiding lamellas to reflect the light into the different levels. We worked out the floor plan together with the architect. And yes, what are the advantages? It is a really compact building. And the unique feature is the good daylight supply and avail availability and the low solar load because it's very compact and low energy consumption. And we compared, compared this building with a conventional site-lit office building, where everybody is sitting close to the facade. And this structure has no limitation in dimension. It can grow in each direction <laughs> because the light comes from above. Yes, the, as I mentioned, it is uh, a luminous structure, structure, but there are also question marks. For example, how about acoustics in the shafts, ventilation? What about uh, the protection, the fire protection, of course? But I hope we can continue this study. Because you can also use the overcast sky and but we made a dimensioning for the mixed sky, I have to uh, admit. Yes, let's talk about the student projects. We teach lighting design at the university in Innsbruck, at the Faculty of Architecture at Studio 2, Institut für Gestaltung. The task of the students is to plan an office expansion for Badenbach on our building site, on a meadow close to our company. And they build scaled models. They dimension the openings in coordination with the orientation. They start with the site analysis. And in this mood board, you can get an impression of the variety of daylight structures they are inventing. Um, I really like this course because I learn a lot. Yes, you, they implement light shafts, but very often they are low-tech buildings. They incline the walls, they work with the surfaces, um, they work with the orientation and the dimensioning of the orientation, the dimensioning of the windows, depending on the orientation. They create light atmospheres that correspond with the use of the room. That's important. A break room has another atmosphere than a working space. They have considered this. It's like a light choreography. 
They perceive and measure daylight. They optimize the building and they integrate artificial lighting. They learn the tools, for example, down lights, wall washer, um, that we perceive illuminated vertical surfaces. This is important. Uh, they get to know lighting simulation tools, but um, it's more important to interpret the results of the lighting simulation tool. And here are some e examples. This project has the prominent feature that it works like a sundial. So the openings react to the different orientations as the sun passes by. Um, they took into account that uh, they um, made small openings in the direction of the south, bigger openings in direction of the north. The break space in, is in the south where you want to get activated by the sunlight. You want the intensive impulse of sunlight and the working areas, they should have a glare-free daylight situation. They build the scale models. We bring it into the artificial sky. We perceive and measure light. The next project is a more atmospheric approach. The atmosphere in the space changes depending on the sun. <laughs> there are light flooded walls and yeah, it's a really interesting, interesting building with different atmospheres in accordance with the use of the building. This is a quite compact building. Um, it is lit from the inside, integrating a patio. There are inclined walls to get the light into the ground floor. Of course, there are also um, small windows for the connection to the outside. And they start with the site analysis, sun path analysis, sunshine duration, and the quality of the place. Another project working with different materials, with different ambiences, light and shadow, reflective elements, with water. We had an exhibition in our world of light and we showed the models and the projects there um, some time ago. Other students working with an underground structure integrated into our meadow in our building site and they have light guiding shafts, they have an atrium and yes, they think they begin with the user and its needs and then they start with the design process. Yeah, my very last topic is a research project and it's called In Integrated Lighting Solutions for Daylighting and Electric Lighting. And at the very end of my presentation, I would like to promote this project. Originally, Jan de Boer, he's mentioned here, wanted to present this project here today. And I do my best to promote it, to present it today. It is a research project Checked within the platform of IEA, the International Energy Agency. And experts from all over the world contribute to the knowledge transfer. It is a platform where they um, present their research projects and they combine <laughs> their knowledge and this project um, brings both worlds together, the artificial light and the daylight. This is the topic of this project. 
the overall objective of the activity is to foster the integration of daylight and electric lighting solutions to the benefits of higher user satisfaction and at the same time energy savings. Bring the both worlds together. There were several subtasks in this huge um, research project that lasted three years. And subtask A analyzed the lighting requirements and the user behavior for integrated lighting solutions. Subtask D deals with the lighting control strategies for integrated light. Subtask C, this was our our task, it illustrates the workflows and software for integrated light, the tools, the standards, the guidelines. So the question was how to plan integrated lighting in our task. There are several tools to do this. I would like to refer to one concept analysis tool called DALEC. It is uh, free of charge. You can use it in the internet. And um, it brings both worlds together. Um, you, in the design process, you already can evaluate the heating, the cooling, and the light situation. And you can optimize the building then. So feel free to have a look at it. It is really useful. And last but not least, subtask D includes numerous field studies and the elaboration of a monitoring protocol for integrated lighting solutions. The results are all available. Here you find the link. The work continues on this issue. And I have to mention such projects are only possible with the support of fundings. And don't forget daylight. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judith. It was very interesting to listen to your lecture. And my colleague just reminded me how important daylight is, especially when you design skyscrapers. I don't know if you remember the story which was in BBC and the international press in the year 2014 about a skyscraper in London called um, Walkie Talkie. And if you would have parked your car at the wrong spot, it would have melted. So it's so important to calculate how a facade could behave because the energy could be very powerful and if you have a, a curved facade, it could concentrate the light in one point and if this is your car, you better park somewhere else. So this was just to underline how important it is to work on excellent daylighting design, to do facade studies, not only for yourself to get enough daylight, but also to think about your neighborhood, what you do to all the people. Of course, driving with a bicycle is, of course, more sustainable than driving with a car. Do you have any questions? Just let me know. It's an open discussion, and we, I'm very glad and happy if you have any questions, and I can forward them. I would like to know, you mentioned at the beginning you were working with an artificial sky. You have a big test facility, actually, there. Which role does this facility have in the time where we do so many computer simulations? We don't have to build models. Um, physically, results could be probably quicker. How do you relate this the combination of real physical models and the possibilities with um, daylight simulations? Of course, we, do, we use the simulation tools, but we additionally use the artificial sky, you get an immediate impression of the light atmosphere. You can change the materials, perceive the effect of a dark floor, a bright floor. You can yeah, measure daylight. And these are the two aspects, seeing light and measuring light. And a simulation does not fulfill this. Yeah. You shared with us a couple of interesting projects where architect were consultant uh, by Bartenbach. Um, can you tell us something about the, um, yeah, collaboration? I could imagine sometimes when architects have a very specific idea about the shape, the form, and the colors of the housing, and then you come as a consultant and probably suggest something else. 
Is this difficult? How much diplomacy is necessary to guide them to a better, more sustainable solution? Yes. Mm. Sometimes it's difficult, but there are many architects that appreciate our advice and we work closely together and there are other disciplines and I think it's getting normal that you have different disciplines um, working on a project, on a project and yes, uh, you, ha you can convince them in our world of light. It's hard to talk about light, that's true. You have to see it, to experience it, and this is why we built this showroom to show the effects of light. Yeah. I could imagine that one important challenge is, of course, also um, working on daylight and economic issues. I could imagine it's wonderful for lighting design, especially for you, if you're interested in daylight, to open up the buildings and you showed us the cross-section like New York, bringing more and more daylight down to there. But I could imagine that investors would be interested to have a floor plan which as many square meters as possible for office spacing, for renting, and that they're not so much interested in daylight. How do you deal with this challenge of economic pressure in your projects? Yes, when I refer to the project, um, the shafts were three per three meters and we compared with a classical office building and we find a compromise. It was okay if it would also convince an investor, I would suppose. Of course, we consider this and yes, some are ideas, but this was a feasibility study and we were eager to built this structure. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Would you like to know more about daylight? If maybe later she's here the uh, complete day, reach out to her, contact her for any advice. One final question to you. You showed us working with light boxes with the students. Have you learned anything from this or was it more learning experience for the students? Did you get any new experience for your professional work from the student work? Yes, an immense uh, learning process, I would say. Um, I learn every time we have this course. Yes, daylight should be, meta, should be a matter in every project. And I also had a course with um, pupils aged 10 or 12 years and they had so uh, astonishing ideas <laughs> how to guide light into a building. I learned a lot from them. And yeah, this is uh, an open book. You can go in, in uh, many directions and create a variety of uh, building structures and the inspirations come with the discussion. Okay. So, thank you again very much, Judith, for this wonderful lecture which you gave about daylight. Thank You're you. Welcome. Oh, there's one question. Yeah. In various form, yeah. You adapt to the light. Okay. I completely support this. So if you have some time left there, visit the Church of Böhm. It's a wonderful, yes, church of concrete brutalism here in Wuppertal, but it works to adapt some minutes and then you can see in a wonderful way how colorful light enters the space and it's a wonderful contrast of bright spots, dim spots, and a wonderful uh, place to contemplate on good daylighting. So, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Now I would like to direct your attention again to a light box. Light boxes have many qualities. They are quite simple to build. You can have just a shoebox and you can start lighting from there on. So this is a very convenient solution within the university to get students to think in a new way without any computer simulations. 
And the next talk uh, will address this topic that light boxes are used as an educational instrument so that you can study a lot of aspects. First of all, perceiving the actual light, not only a rendering on a computer screen with a different luminance, it's also about planning and uh, design and questions how you should, could integrate different ways of technology. And a model is wonderful that you can test something, that you can change it, and if you just have a cardboard model, it's pretty cheap. So you can actually do a lot of changes without investing too much money, which is also important for a student budget. And it's wonderful, you can just go on your balcony and test it at different sites, um, bring it in different directions and study sunlight, daylight, and the question is also, can you work with some kind of stage lighting effects in there? For this topic, we have a wonderful speaker, and I'm very glad that we have Marianne Keriaku here. We have collaborated some time ago via Australia when we worked uh, together on a book about, uh, called Superlux by Davinia Jackson, Smart Light Art Design and Architecture for Cities. And she has contributed a wonderful chapter, so it's worth to study this. You can read another chapter written by me. But now it's a stage for Marianne Keriaco. She has, she still looks very young, but her CV tells me she has a 25-year experience in lighting. So the secret of looking good is working a lot with good daylight and good electrical lighting, sometimes optimized with ideas from stage lighting. She has intensive experience with teaching, so for you as students, it might be interesting to compare your experience from your university, what Karen Marianne has taught, for example, at the University of Applied Science in Ostwestfalen Lippe here in Germany. She is very fascinated about yeah, scenography and urban spaces. This can be seen um, in the fact that she is founder of a light festival called Vivid Light in Sydney. And because sustainability is very important, she was um, exploring how can you work on a very low energy level and create a fe light festival. This is what she has done in Singapore at the Marina Bay. So it's really about the combination of design, and with her interest in music, it's a complete scenography she's thinking of. It's a very interdisciplinary approach where she is working. And if you would like to know anything about the future, it will be interesting to follow her even next year. 2023 will be the year when um, Marianne will publish a book. Um, about lighting, and I think we get a little preview about the light boxes, which will be part of the book. So please give a warm welcome to Marianne Keriaku. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank Thomas. That was a really nice introduction. And also to the previous speaker, Judith, that was also terrific. Um, it was just so inspirational, Judith, to see how from lighting principles and exploration with models and then into the laboratory and then to see it actually realised in an amazing, in all of those amazing projects and then working together with students. Um, so. And I'd also like to thank the Lichtechnische Gesellschaft, also the BDER, for inviting me today, Christina Herrmann. I see um, we have some students also from Detmold, and also my family is here, my children are here, my tutor's here, my Mitarbeiter is here, and um, yeah, thank you all for being here today. So, not to give too many delays on the boxes, so I've got a couple of little boxes back here which I'll introduce to you shortly. And um, let me just go to here. So Thomas has already touched on some of the problems which we have. I'll just turn this around so I can walk around a little bit. Just give me a moment. <laughs> so, um, yeah, one of the, one of the yeah, critical realities in lighting education is essentially um, what happens when the experts get it wrong. What have they done wrong? So, um, the most important part of being a lighting designer is seeing how we can, well, we had a, had a taste of that from Judith, how we can integrate our 
our understanding from emotion, from, from experience, from light, from daylight. I mean, this is, these are elements which are grounded in us, which is essentially our biological aspects of how we experience light. So not only that, light is a great thing, but this is where the example which Thomas mentioned earlier, where the experts get it wrong. So here's 20 Fenchurch Street, London. So that's a, also known as the Walkie Talkie Tower. And as correctly pointed out, it, at certain times of the year, because of the parabolic curvature of the facade, it can burn an egg or it can fry an egg on a, on a car. So there's been quite a bit of publicity. So what did they have to do? They have to hang a huge big curtain on the facade to stop this from happening. So we're talking about light pollution, not just light pollution in the nighttime illuminating the skies, but light pollution by day. So that's heat, that's heat from into the environment, light causing glare. So one of the um, key elements of when we're designing with light is that we want to reduce the glare. We want to create points of interest. We want to create an experience. And this is a really embarrassing example of what happens when you don't build a little model, when you don't, when you just rely on digital tools or BIM or whatever, and you just think, I've got a great shape, I've got a great facade, and then bam, you turn into these disappointing situations and extremely expensive and extremely embarrassing. So, he's not the only one. There's good old Frank Geary here. So in America, there's the Walt Disney Building. They built it, it looked fabulous with all these curves, dynamic architecture, BIM, etc. And then, what was the problem? The neighbors aren't happy. So when we think about interior design, we also need to think about what's happening outside. And this is where lighting connects everything. Lighting is not just the interiors. It's not just the facade, it's life. So, and that means people. So that takes us back to human-centered lighting. But here, we need to think about what did Frank Geary do wrong? Clearly, what do you think he did wrong? What's that? Those curves, all that metal, sunshine, daylight, heat. And what did they have to do here? Does anyone know? Yeah, they had to sandblast it down, yeah? Schleifen in German. So someone had to go there and work over those surfaces. Now that's, you could say, all publicity is good publicity, but as an architect, I would have to say that's pretty embarrassing. Yeah, so all of you architects out there, pay note to these big names. So, perception-based lighting. Perception-based lighting. This is what we're about today. This is where we're at. Do you think it's something new? Nah, that's nothing new. I mean, our forefathers already knew about perception-based lighting. Yeah, you stand in the sun, you get a nice suntan, you know, but this is something else here when we're talking about lighting. So I took the time to um, think about why is it that perception-based lighting suddenly is everything which we talk about now? Because it's not just, okay, we know about, we've got this amazing history where in the 19, early 1900s, you had the, the um, uh, perception psychologists from Germany. Um, actually, I want to say something. It is an absolute honor. I come from Bondi, Sydney, and to be here today in Wuppertal, which I even, didn't even know the name of before I came today, but, um, and I've been in Germany like almost 10 years, but um, I just would like to say that the Germans are fantastic theorists and have got great, um, a great basis in um, perception psychology. So that, to start with, in the 1900s, and towards um, mid-century, last century, um, Richard Kelly, with his approach to um, theatrical um, techniques, he developed ingenious. How can you, in a black box, create three products or three concepts? 
Yeah, in German, Licht zum Sehen, Licht zum Hinsehen, Licht zum Ansehen. In English, um, ambient glow, focal glow, and then a little bit of jazz and special effects. So these are the tools which we use in lighting design also today, which I also share with my students. Then I come to the next point. In the 1960s and the 1970s, Volker Schultz is my predecessor. And I have to say, I'm standing on very big shoulders because he was Germany, in, he set up the first light lab in Germany, and that's in Detmold. In Detmold, we have a very, very long tradition in light planning, um, which Volker Schultz established, and then that was carried on by my predecessor, Harold Gresser. And then for me, me as what do I do, you know? So my thing is, is this part of engineering, part of music, part of light, and I've had to also bring about my concepts to make our light lab into, into my vision. So from Volker Schultz, his key concepts in perception were room contours, how space can be described in terms of atmosphere, hard light or soft light, on, and then he then proceeds to the next experience, which is the brightness distribution. How we experience the space is where the light is coming from. So that could be the morning scene where the, where the sun is low, which is a red-blue a red colour, or midday when it's, a, when it's a much cooler blue colour, and then again in the evening to a warm red colour. So these are, this is where Volker Schultz um, had created a series of schematics to explain these ideas of brightness levels, and then taking that one step further, how he um, developed the idea of also um, colour perception in his model. So how we perceive colours, for example, under different lighting conditions, like my children can tell you here, that at night time they can't see any colours. So, but of course, exit lighting is, is a green colour because that's the colour which we can um, which we are able to perceive at low lighting levels. Um, so the next person in the 1970s and 80s from America was William Lamb. Of course, Barton Bach, sorry, he is also, I do know that Volker Schultz was in consultation and a discussion with him, and Volker Schultz did pass away a couple of years ago at 89, just for information. Um, and I did have um, numerous discussions with him for my upcoming book. So the next person is William Lamb. So William Lamb produced a monumental book which is to do with perception and lighting as form givers of architecture. And there is the basis of daylighting concepts in architecture. And going through um, examples and going through his project examples of how daylight and sunlight can modulate and express space. And then, we come to the next big step, human-centered design. So from human-centered design, we have evolved to design thinking. From design thinking, we have evolved to human-centered lighting, where the visual aspect of the environment, of the luminous environment, is integrated also with the standards, the German standards for lighting. Then the next part is the emotional level with light. And then the third part to do with the emotional and the biological aspects of light, which has really seen a huge explosion in the last 10 years with um, understanding the, the relationship between the different times of day and how this then influences our body's circadian rhythm. So I would just like to highlight a couple of people who I have found in my teaching process to, um, in terms of concepts, which are quite pivotal concepts for learning about lighting design. So Hervé's Discots from France, he introduces the idea of six principles of light as a tool, um, Spears and Major London, Made by Light, this is a terrific book which explores atmospheres, um, emotions, the emotional aspects of light with, an, with a light language. Um, myself, which I'll, this, the book will be coming out soon, which is about observation um, using a method which I've developed. 
and lit kunt, lit kunst licht um, on the on the website for those students who are there. There's a terrific website where there's um, excerpts which are also available um, for download in English. It's called Licht.Wissen. I'm not the founder of this website, but it's a terrific resource um, when you want to um, understand the German standards a little, applications, etc. And this is, um, and, um, and the director from Licht, Kunst Licht has a terrific um, lecture on um, human-centered lighting. So, human-centered lighting approaches today as we practice them. So, as I mentioned, um, I teach in Detmold um, at the um, University of Applied Sciences. We are the largest interior design faculty in the world. So, we are essentially um, producing the interior designers for Germany and for the future. And I know many of you here have either taught in Detmold or studied in Detmold, but it is an institution. And after this, you are very, very welcome to contact me, and I can also take you through our laboratory, which also has a light lab, an artificial sky, also a new Gonio photometer, um, an Ulbricht Kugel, which is um, here is um, Peter Schuster, my Mitarbeiter. Stand up, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter goes into um, retirement this year, but he's been an absolute invaluable part of my team and an invaluable um, member of the Light Lab for the last, well, since 2010, 12 years. So you're also invited next week on Wednesday to a party in Detmold to celebrate, that's at 6 p.m. by the way, to celebrate Peter's last events here at our university. So let us go back to human-centered lighting approaches. So what do I teach the students? So when we're looking at Richard Kelly, Richard Kelly developed a fantastic toolbox for theater theatre lighting. The next person, let's have a look at, well, concepts, visual, the, the, the visual, the emotional, and the biological with human-centered lighting. The next, as I mentioned before, the six principles of lighting design from Descotts, and also the three levels of perception as a guide. And then the next, perhaps unknown, is light mapping. Light mapping, something which often is missed in light planning is the dramaturgy of the space. How do we move through the space? Where are we looking to? What are we concentrated on? We look first to the brightest point, but then also to contrast. And uh, Sage, Ru uh, Sage Russell from America, he has a terrific book which is also exploring these concepts of light mapping, of how you map light and experience through the space. So, when we think about white spaces, we think about daylighting. When we think about black boxes, we think about theater lighting. Each of these spaces have a topology, a topology of space which essentially, when you think about a black box, it's not only a theater space, but the theater space can be also in a theater, also in a shopping mall, in a casino, in a trade fair, in a media center, in a movie place, shops, etc., discotheques, clubs. In contrast, we have the other situation, which is the majority of situ applications where um, daylight and sunlight are applied. So these two, require different toolkits. So, deciding to create from darkness or light requires different approaches, and that's where we come to teaching practice. So, um, this, what I'm presenting today, is taught in the fundamentals of lighting in the fourth semester of a bachelor degree of interior design, and the, the core principles and methodology of the course is to introduce the students to learning by doing. 
Exper experiential learning, so that is communicating, socialising their ideas, presenting and learning a visual language to do with light, space, emotion, and these very, very complex interrelations between each of those elements. So this here is the this is here the, the projects which they do. So, what are the light box learning objectives? The students create an interior space. They explore light, colour, surface, materials, experience and emotion, and in a clouded sky condition. Why a clouded sky condition, you ask? Yeah, I'm from Sydney. When I came to Germany, I had to relearn everything I know about daylighting and learn everything about climate. It was, for me, the biggest shock to realise that in Detmold, 80% of the time, we have the clouded sky condition. And that's not just in Detmold, people, it's this whole region. So, and not only that, it produces, it means that how we approach the interiors needs to understand climate, needs to understand the effects of the grey sky by introducing more grey into the interiors, more black into the interiors. What are you going to end up with? Humans that are not very happy, yeah? Turn up the sun, turn, turn up the sun, bring on the heat, and Germans are the happiest people on earth. So, all I can say is that I love my German colleagues, but this for me was a big, 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 big shock. Clouded skies. But not only that, clouded skies can be modelled with, with the sunshine and sunlight that is much more difficult to model. So we have a constant kind of condition that we can model, which is then linked to the standards of controlling of how and creating standards of how much light is required in a space through the daylight factor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also the German stands with how we control sunlight. Yeah. So I take you back to our laboratory. This is our test box. This is a box which I worked out that in the 10 years that Peter has been in debt mode. He has examined 1,800 boxes <laughs> with me. <laughs> so, and before that, um, Harold Gresser, my predecessor, he was there for 10 years also, so he had another 1,800 boxes. And before him was 40 years of Volker Schultz. So those who've been to Detmold have done the box. So. Who's been to Detmold? Who's studied in Detmold? Now, I know there's more of you that... Yeah, hello, my lovely students. You're studying in Detmold. <laughs> so, this is, a, this is the black box with a white box. And here we have um, artificial light inside a white diffused box. And the students, as Thomas mentioned earlier, we have very, very simple materials so that cost pretty much nothing. And we have a set size, which the students then have to come within um, the, the, the dimensions of, of, of this box. And, and then with very, very simple tools, like I said, basically their eyes and their fingers, eye and finger connection, they start observing what's happening in the box, in the scene that they're creating. And as I mentioned, this is for a clouded sky condition. What did we do in the corona time? Well, we still are in the corona time. What did we do when we taught online? We had to create the box a little differently. Students then had to create the box with a 45 degree angle, which represented daylight at 45 degrees. And then, if you can even just see a little bit into the box, can you all see a little bit into the box? The effect of sunlight in a space which is then animated by these coloured filters. So, are there any questions so far? 
Any questions? Any comments? So far, so good? OK. <laughs> All right, so what are our students doing? So they're sitting there in the, in the fourth semester. What are they actually manipulating? What are they trying out in their box? They're, they're trying material surfaces. They, they are exploring the physics of light. What do we actually experience? Reflection, emission, and what else? Students? And transmission. <laughs> OK. So, and with this, not only that, they have to explore these aspects of um, intensity of light, the brightness, they need to, they come into the, into the um, light lab, they've been working at home with this situation, they come into the box and they go, Marianne, what's happening? Frau Kiriaku, es gibt etwas los in mein box. Was ist los? And I say, they ask me, what's going on in my box? What's going on? I said, I know exactly what you've done. You've sat at your desk with your table light and basically you have got this direct light situation. What you need to work towards is the clouded sky condition, which is completely different. So. In the next semester, in the seventh semester with us, the students then do daylight and artificial lighting together with a lighting project. But I would like to say the clouded sky condition in this region is fantastic because you don't even need a light lab. You just bring your box outside and carry out measurements. Fantastic. I mean, shortcut things. So everybody has a light lab. It's called the sky, yeah? So next, what do we teach there? So what, what am I teaching? Methodology, a process, a process of exploring, a process of experimenting, a process to research, because like I said, light connects everything. Light connects humans with our environment and it's an experience and an emotion. So, iPads away, iPhones away, Androids away, let's get back to some pencils. And here we have my toolkit, a series of Faber-Castell, a German company, of different colours of whites, of how we render a space with a cool colour temperature, a cold colour temperature, a very warm colour temperature, and simply grey to render. Here are examples of my own sketches. This is parallel to me teaching the principles of light. My colleagues are also teaching about temporary spaces. So this is a Buckminster Fuller, Fuller geodome, and here I've created different setups of how we can create different experiences in a temporary space. And the way that I usually work, I have my filters, I have my colours, and I also include the material, a little sample of the material, the light affecting material, which I then use and then describe in my setup with creating first ideas with some research. And then, that's what I mean. So I've, I've tried this product and it's too heavy. Um, then I have an alternate, something which is a bit more glossy. And then there's the concept then, when we think about temporary sp spaces, we are in a different time. We must think about the environment. We must be sustainable. There is a big market to rent lighting. So this is where we can think about for example, a temporary space. How can theatrical lights and other products, which are now rentable since corona, how can we integrate those concepts into our, into our project? And where to from here after they've done the light box? In the, in the summer school, I offer lighting details, so using rentable products. So here is some more. Um, what I wanted to highlight here with this example of an exhibition for the Louvre in Paris is how not only do we need to think about sketching the idea, but we need to think about... This is something which I actually picked up from Holger Klein, the dramaturgy. How do you then, with the space, 
create sketches to describe how you want people to move through the space. We have a box here. You can only look in one direction, but I can control where you look. And with that, I, before that, I have an intention of where you should look. So this is with these small diagrams here. These small diagrams indicate how the objects, how the materials then bring our vision to the point of focus. So, um, as I said, this box has been taught by architects, it's been taught by engineers, it's been taught by everybody that I know. <laughs> so, how could I bring something which I know into something which already exists? So, for me, when we think about Gute Gestalt principles, and we go back to the 1900s and we know that there's these Gute Gestalt principles, it is not just a visual language, it's also in music. Gute Gestalt also exists in music, and I have also studied music, so thank you. <laughs> I'm just gonna wrap it up a little quicker. So, when we explore these concepts in music, um, as I mentioned, so lighting and music, what are, the, what are the two things? Both of them have fine structures which we cannot grab, but creates the whole experience. So the students start with, um, in the seminar, listening to a piece of music, well, they do some research, they choose some, they choose some pictures, and then what they do is they select a piece of music which goes with that picture. And what's extremely interesting is when I project their inspiration and I play the music, pretty much everybody will guess which image goes with the music. And I know that you all have favorite music, and I know that you've watched music videos, and have you ever heard your piece of music and then suddenly seen a music video and were completely shocked of the way that they interpreted your favorite song? So, in the box, it's all about interpretation, but there are some pr parameters. So, as I mentioned, exploring dramaturgy, um, exploring the physics of light with discovery and experimentation, and the students are encouraged to explain what they're doing. Then the next part is the design development, corrections. When I first came to Detmold, I was shocked at how many corrections go on. What are corrections? Why is the professor saying so many things what the students are doing wrong? Surely they don't have, can't they just be free and just do whatever they like? But no, corrections are extremely important because corrections, for example, what you see here are some straws and you see a lot of reflection happening here. But as we saw in the previous example from Judith, it is through the surfaces which are in the skylight, which are slightly glossy, that we can then experience a dynamic which is then reflected from the sunlight into the space. So reflections and glossy surfaces in this kind of way can create disorientation, but it can also create very beautiful effects, which is what we have previously seen. Here's another situation. This is a common mistake for all of you. Diffused sky situation, the clouded sky. Here the student wanted to create a silhouette, but the silhouette doesn't happen in a diffused sky because we have diffused shadows. So we need to introduce another surface to reveal the form, a reflective surface. Here again, concepts about silhouette and shadows and corrections, and here is the example which I showed you to demonstrate and highlight the difference between diffused and directional light. So, next is the articulation and communication of the idea. So once the students has carried out all their investigations, they then build a final model. This is an example of a, of a sunrise, which has been abstracted into a tunnel form. And as you can see, there are some light reflections here. How can you create reflections in a diffused space? Again, it's got to do with the surface properties. And I'll just go, here is another thing, which is when I speak about dramaturgy, it's not just about dramaturgy, it's about tempo. Every single space has a tempo. And that is created by the visual scene here. What is the tempo here? 
Is it slow or is it faster? Who says slow? Who says a little fast? Yeah, and why? Yeah, because everything is converging to a point. The light has a rhythm. The light is also pointing in the direction. The light is this cold, very cold, on the ground and on the side. It creates a feeling of movement. All right, and then there's a few more, a couple more examples. And then finally, to end my conversation today and my talk, I have done something for you. I've created a short music composition, which I'll play for you. This is a composition of today's talk, which is to do with the visual score, the visual score of process, and using music and concepts in music to articulate emotion. So this is it, ready? So to articulate the first part, which is, so the, the points which I brought up today, research, gute Gestalt, experimentation, corrections, and finally the end of the presentation. So light with a forte, emotion, space, material, psychology, contrast. Itten, 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 itten. Lighting techniques. Kelly, Lamb, Schultz. Human-centered design. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Presentation, presentation. Thank you. Give me a hand. Thank you very much for this wonderful event, <laughs> composition for this. And it was great to see uh, sharing Richard Kelly. And I'm very proud that I'm working at Echo, where I met the person who did the photos for this. Because Klaun Young Mark, the manager of Echo, thought when we talk about Richard Kelly's and we are, when we are just reading his text, we hear those terms like focal glow, ambient luminescence, and play of brilliance. But how can you visualize them? And he thought about some kind of global language. So it should be not a Roman statue, for example. And he came up with the idea of using a sphere for a hat and then the cube. It's a very, very general element. And then he set up those photos. And it's very, just very interesting to see where they appear all <laughs> over in the lighting <laughs> design community. So thank you very much. And I would like to offer you now a break. So, oh, any questions? Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes. <laughs> Just a second, please. Thank you. Uh, for example, you do a project for a client. I'm yeah. sure you did it a lot of times. <laughs> uh, did you try to deliver your idea through the music as well, and how did you do it? It's, because it's difficult sometimes, but it's I also mean, understandable. That's, that's a really interesting point. Of course, if it's something to do with a discotheque or a theater, I mean, this black box approach is something which we all can relate to. But for me, this semester, I mean, I've been teaching now, I just said to Thomas today, 10 years in debt mold. <laughs> Actually, next year when the books come out, that is my 10 years in debt mold in April. And I have to say, I have only trusted myself now to introduce these concepts of how you should use what you already know with music into architectural space and an interior space. And I think from my experience from this semester, and Peter Schuster can also say it, We've had the most exciting semester listening and looking at what inspires students and how they can reinterpret those aspects of light with music. <laughs> so I think we will have a 15 minute break. You can reach out to Marianne yep. and talk more okay. detail. I saw your um, son had also a remark and probably will discuss this in the break, so we'll now have a 50-minute break. Reach out to Marianne and you can ask her many, many more questions. She will be here for the rest of the day and we will see each other at 10 minutes after 4 o'clock uh, with the next talk. So far, thank you very much for staying here <laughs> and I look forward to see you back here in 15 minutes. <laughs>
Ja, hallo, es ist eine Freude, auf dieser großen Bühne zu stehen und ich würde diejenigen, die noch zweifelnd im Eingang stehen, langsam bitten, sich wieder auf die Plätze zu begeben. Um, so I'm also asking the students from my university to come back to the audience. Sit down, please. Yeah. So, I think we can start with the next lecture. The next lecture is given by Dr. Thomas Schielke and uh, the idea is, or the title is, Changing Needs in Lighting Design from Lux Level to System Thinking. And Mr. Schielke, you know him already because he would, did the presentations we had. Mr. Schielke uh, was also introducing himself that he is working at ERCO and doing door, uh, there dot, and doing there a lot of research. So I think you will give us some insights about your new findings and about the research you can do that. And this title is challenging because um, not only in the lighting design education, what we have, for example, at Hochschule Hildesheim, or also at Hochschule Wismar and at Hochschule Detmold and in other universities, there is a new way of thinking that we see that lighting is more than looking at the Lux level and that it is a more complex problem we have to solve. And I can see the first slide and I see that this is really what the topic is where you are into, will introduce us in the complexity of lighting. Thomas, thank you very much for this introduction and a warm welcome to everyone here. What is the consequence when light is not only a source for vision, but it triggers reactions in our body, like alertness, cognitive performance, and our inner clock. It has been over 20 years that research has have found a new photoreceptor working on our circadian rhythm. But it took the International Commission for Lighting more than 15 years to officially define light in a new way. And the question is, how has this development with the new photoreceptor influence the solar decathlon here in Wuppertal. The first solar decathlon in Washington in 2002 has mirrored a dilemma in the understanding of good lighting. This problem was even more severe beyond the campus ground in the professional world. Stressed engineers have looked at single numbers and have forgotten that light is much more than some data points, while architects have designed creative visions for luminous environments. And the question is, what can we learn from this um, um, development here? And only after the report and the feedback of one participant, the Virginia Tech University, and their critical remarks about the um, guidelines for the comp uh, competition, the organizers have initiated a collaboration with the IALD, the International Association of Lighting Designers. As a result, not only one factor was a criteria for the uh, evaluation of the concept, but they considered also another modus, light for living. It was a very small step, but a very important one, for coming from the quantity of light towards the quality of light for an alternative lighting scenario. And the question is, is the criteria of illuminance sufficient for initiating um, innovative design? Probably not. 
because we have already heard something about William Lamb, a legendary lighting designer in the USA who has focused on the perception orientation and not just on lux levels. 2002 has also, has also been the year when David Burson discovered the first photosensitive um, ganglion cells, which are triggering our inner clock. And this has started a completely new debate and thought about how should we work in a new way about the lighting design. So with the discovery of the ganglion cells, which are triggering our inner clock, it has also raised the question, how do we need to measure light in the future? Because we can't look only on the normal lux levels, which are there for the visible light, but we need to evaluate the invisible light and the impact on the human being. So for that reason, the EML, the equivalent melanopic lux, has become a central factor to evaluate sufficient lighting for our inner clock. And the discovery of the new photoreceptor has led to a very interesting race to find the perfect formula to increase well-being and performance. Imagine that you can set up lighting in a way that it helps students, uh, kids in school to stay awake in the morning and that they even collaborate more actively in class. And in addition, publications have emerged pointing out the potential of light for the industry, for, employee, for, for employers, when the employees start to work more concentrated with the right light just requiring a little bit more of energy. And this discovery of the photoreceptor cell a couple of years later went in line with, that with the advancements of the LED technology, now capable of color changing, similar to the bright light around the, new uh, at the noontime in with a very cool color, and then for the evening going to much warmer color. Lighting designers did not have to wait very long for the industry, and the first products emerged, which have pointed out with a sticker, human-centric lighting for good lighting. Some more critical designers were a little bit surprised by the fact that just a single fact, like tunable white feature, is sufficient to fulfill all promises of human-centric lighting, because this concept was originally thought as a very holistic approach. The desire to create a reform for lighting was understandable because we have seen lighting for a very long time that it was just based on, con on a concept of static lighting and just for sufficient illumination. Then for large drawing boards, and there we see engineers working on a large surface on very small details and correcting their mistakes even with, with a razor blade. The criteria of uniformity contributed also to safety. But as a result, we have seen that many office spaces look like a very dull scene, similar to a cloudy sky and without any major changes during the working hours and over the different seasons. And then, with the um, arrival of the computer technology, we have seen another change. Now, the horizontal uh, work plane, which was there for a very long time, changed into a luminous surface which we have there to work in the environment. And the computer has also reduced the large size of the, work, of the large drawing boards to a much smaller screen. And this development required another component for lighting. It required some kind of louvres uh, to improve the visual comfort because there would be a lot of glaring reflective um, reflections on the monitors at this time. Today, this is probably similar to your environment, we still have now an environment where it's pretty easy even on a screen to zoom in in contrast to the large drawing boards. And if there are any mistakes, it's just a mouse click. However, the lighting standards have mainly been very similar to all the regulations which we have seen there for the old regulations for paperwork. 
For decades, we have been confronted with constant light in the interior spaces. And for the exterior spaces, we see a lot of variance over the day and over the years. The light levels are quite different. How would you perceive a an interior space which would have a similar variety like the daytime? And would the variation around 500 lux have a similar effect on our well-being compared to staying out um, in the exterior space? Those are just a few points which have still not been clearly answered. There are still many more open questions regarding the right lighting and human-centric lighting and the, uh, the, um, the circadian rhythm. And what we can see is, with uh, this comparison here, that the researcher, researchers have mainly agreed on this summary based on science. Cool, bright light at daytime for activities and warm, dimmed light in the evenings to get good sleep. Accordingly to this, we come very close to the experience what generations of people have felt intuitively when they were in nature. The temptation to bring the atmosphere of the outdoor lighting into the interior space is very high. But it, has, but it raises also a couple of questions. Thousands of lux on a table would create severe gla glare problems, similar to having wearing sunglasses uh, when you're being outside on a very bright and sunny day there. And we see that this is also something which ra and raises another question about how we relate those um, different um, situations there um, in the overall lighting there. And so what we have to make sure is that there's another dimension between exterior lighting and interior lighting, and that means the disadvantages of requiring more energy. The step from 500 lux to maybe 10,000 lux for the interior space when we would take the daylight into the interior space would mean that we raise the energy uh, demand with a factor about 20. And we are still far away from the level of a bright sunny day with 50,000 lux. But we know that we can't go this way because the Paris Agreement has showed us that they are a driver to address the climate crisis and the energy efficiency. And today we can see that we can't fool anymore with empty energy promises there. And this has been um, shown very clearly by the Fridays for Future genera uh, young generation and their protests, what they're doing there. The first law cases which are there and where the courts ordered the governments to increase the energy targets also underlines the power of the young generation. This young generation has created very inspiring solutions, which we can see uh, out there here at the Solar Decathlon, are giving us a very hopeful um, vision about what can be possible. The only possibility to bring this together when we see the rising complexity of all those factors coming here together is that we need to think light in a new way. The only response can be to think the lighting in system thinking, like Megan Seibert has pointed out here. It means that when we, when we improve one aspect in lighting, it could create a disadvantage in other categories of the whole system. Let me illustrate this with an example. Even from a very far distance, we can detect crazy developments in our environment due to lighting. We have saved a lot of energy with a technical transition from tungsten lamps to LED technology. But at the same time, our satellites have recorded that we have produced much more light pollution. This aspect could have been much more reduced and minimized with more careful planning and with more precise lighting technology. But unfortunately, the excitement about the availability of energy-efficient possibilities was much more in favor of extending existing installation 
installing more light than really thinking about sustainable solutions and not thinking in a short-term um, corridor there. As a counter-reaction to this, we see with the increasing light pollution everywhere that there's a growing market for dark sky parks. To compensate the limited visibility of the Milky Way and the dark sky there, and examples like the dark sky space for, um, and reservation in uh, Rhone here is an outstanding example there that there's a new understanding about our environment. The rising need feeding a growing population has also led to a growing demand for light. And we can see this here in the, uh, in the photography uh, very impressively captured by the aerial photography of Tom Hagen in the Netherlands, while also revealing the light pollution generated by the greenhouses. In London, London went a different way. They went underground uh, with their first subterranean urban farm with regenerative lighting, uh, re regenerative energy for lighting and thereby bringing production much closer to the consumers. Some clients have taken their optimism and their trust in efficient technology to a very extreme level, and they are offering build, um, uh, living opportunities without daylight, just with electrical lighting. Inspired by Disney cruise ships with their virtual portholes, as a result, the international press has strongly criticized this plan for a student dorm in California. But don't give up hope. There, is, there are interesting solutions. For example, even underground spaces could look very attractive. What we can learn, for example, in the southeast corner of the Central Park in New York where Apple has opened its famous um, store at the Fifth Avenue. After the redesign by Fosters and Partners, even more daylight flooded the interior space. And the, inter and the design team even integrated dynamic lighting, changing the illuminance level and the light colors. When we com um, compare now the clinic atmosphere of the student dorm, and the vivid impression of the Apple Store, we can see which potential lies in a holistic design approach, which is much more long-term, instead of looking to short-term solution, maximizing the economic um, profit here. Where can we find actually solutions help us to think about uh, systems thinking and lighting design? Jennifer Fage has created a very smart concept about to think lighting in a new way. She has linked architecture with individual well-being and added the economic perspective. For many years, we have seen spaces which just co concentrated on visibility and activity, and often with very quick solutions, just focusing on 500 lux and very uniform light. This has led to a frust frustration for many designers and explains why we see a renaissance of light quality in the market, for example, with the uh, term human-centric lighting. With the recent di discussion about the climate crisis and light pollution, I would like to suggest to add a fourth category, adding the ecology, not only to think about the individual well-being, but for the whole society, and taking into consideration the impact of light on plants and on animals. Some solutions may not even require a lot of expensive high-tech. For instance, the Liter of Light campaign has turned into a low-cost blessing for more than one million homes. Daylight is much cheaper than electrical lighting. And this bottle can achieve as much light as a 40 to 60 watt um, incandescent lamp there. And in addition, 
this project is an outstanding example to reuse material. In a similar way, Brad Kerner thought about the issue of materiality and simplicity when he designed his bamboo pendant. His design addressed the issues of life cycle assessment in many different ways, regarding the control gear, regarding the LED light source, for example, how to construct and to recycle the luminaire later on. And it has created a benchmark for the lighting industry. In addition, he initiated a very interesting discussion about how to negotiate be between the perfect options for recycling and high performance for lighting. Because bringing both together is quite tricky. And the question is, what is more sustainable of the two aspects? And how should we balance those two par parameters in the best way? And I'm sure in the future we will see a lot of examples with superficial biophilic design, for example, with nature prints and luminaires. But this is just fast fashion imagery and will not really help us to solve the issues of long-term sustainability. In order to push the moment of recycling as much as possible into the future, it is necessary to rethink the aspect of adaptability uh, regarding the technical infrastructure in the environment. That means, for example, changing the, um, the light beam for new requirements with it in a different way, or adjusting to new tech tech and control systems in the future will help that the value of the luminaire infrastructure will not decrease in value. And updates, for example, for the control gear and um, for the light source are a crucial element so that it will be possible in the future to have luminaires which could last in operation 30 to 40 years. When I'm summarizing now all those requirements, we can easily see that the solar decathlon Wuppertal, and for the last 20 years, has been confronted with an increasing number of re lighting requirements by different te technical organizations and their recommendations for good lighting. The question is, how do we get out of this? Would it help if we add all those factors up to find the perfect formula for good lighting? Probably not. I see some head shaking there. Really, probably not. Because we still miss a lot of important aspects. Just think about the user behavior. The best control system will not have, help you if you have a very difficult interface and where the user behavior is quite tricky. And there are still many issues regarding daylight. And don't forget the architectural design issues. So which tips could you use for your next project that help you to cope with the rising complexity and to benefit of system thinking. First of all, accept that there's no quick copy and paste option. This must be, I think, very f disappointing for the students here, that they have developed wonderful buildings and concepts, but probably they will not be able to take this solution to somewhere else. And many student teams have already experienced this when they have taken their local design and adapted this with the climate data for Wuppertal. And so those are important aspects which we need to address when we think in a new way there. A second aspect is prepare to understand new points of view. That means start a more intense collaboration to benefit from the expert knowledge of many people which are here around in this hall and worldwide uh, available as consultants. And I have seen that with all the projects here exhibition at the Solar Decathlon, that this was a core experience for many teams there and contributed to their success, uh, which has been awarded in many different ways. Thirdly, build in flexibility. Times change. Best for performance for two weeks here in Wuppertal is not enough. 
best performance in the professional world for just one year is not enough. We need to think about technical solutions where the lighting infrastructure is flexible to cope with the challenges of the next decades. That's, I think, a very crucial point. So when we take systems thinking, it is possible to address multiple issues of, um, uh, in lighting design. It is possible to work, for example, on the architecture, highlighting, for example, the walls to give a very wide space, offering visual comfort for activities and bringing a very creative atmosphere into the space. You might think this is only possible with a lot of energy and that this is luxury. But the solar decathlon shows you this year in Wuppertal that this is possible. And you could even gain a surplus of energy to share with others. For instance, the team from Düsseldorf have used their best skills and system thinking to work on the architecture, to provide a very nice light for activities and for creative lighting. And they have generated a surplus energy building. And they are sending out a very important message to the society that lighting quality can be linked to sustainability and to energy efficiency. Let me close with one final remark. Don't fall in love with efficient technology too fast. It could happen that you wake up with your personal sunrise and you're very enthusiastic, you stay at home, and then for the evening you have already defined your favorite sunset to go to bed. But don't be surprised when your rural daylight sensors will send a notification to your smartphone telling you you have perceived not enough daylight on this day and it's time to go out and enjoy some daylight. And for that reason, I think, make sure that you don't belong to the lost indoor generation. Therefore, please keep your eyes open to all developments. In daylight, it's coming in here, then you have the electrical lighting, you have perception and system thinking. Thank you very much. Hallo? Ja, doch, es geht. Hallo. Äh, ja, vielen Dank, Thomas, für diesen sehr interessanten Vortrag. Du hast, äh, glaube ich... In Englisch? Ah, uh, ja. Yeah. <lacht> Thank you very much for this very interesting um, lecture. So I think you were really showing us the history of the, the development of the new forms of design thinking and uh, what we should uh, respect for the future. And, uh, um, yeah, I would beg you or ask first, are there questions from the audience? Over there, yeah. Firstly, thank you, Thomas. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I would, I would like to see perhaps um, my talk was a little bit more about this experience of atmosphere, music, space. When we talk about systems thinking, how do you feel um, that perhaps um, music or these other senses? What role does that have to play? Do you, from your systems thinking model, um, what role does that has to have have to play? in this um, changing way of thinking about lighting. I have to admit, I have not explored that much uh, the perspective of music, but I think when we address issues of lighting, we can think about the sound in a building. And today we see, for example, ceilings where the light is coming out and they help to work on the acoustics. 
it not, it's not in the way that we think about music and some kind of composition, but it's about um, the audio noise, which we have normally in a building, and with the infrastructure, for example, or for the lighting system, you can combine this. That means you could increase your value regarding the lighting and combine this with acoustic elements, for example, like we have seen here uh, in one installation from the Stuttgart team, for example, where they worked on an indirect illumination and had an acoustic ceiling there, thinking this as a holistic system. So it really um, is something regarding the application. If you are in a cultural building where music is very uh, important in contrast to a living environment where you would like to maybe have just, just some quiet environment around you. So this is something, and it would be very interesting uh, to start a collaboration to think how system thinking could interact with the audio environment uh, in our architecture for more sustainability. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have also the quest uh, question. So I was introducing uh, the day today by giving a quote that uh, uh, light um, modulates uh, between or uh, is a bridge, let's say it uh, more simple. Um, light is a bridge between the person and the space. And how would you see this quote in relation to your system thinking? Yeah, everybody stands in a built environment and creates some kind of relation in a physical way with the space, perceiving the light there. So, and it's very interesting to see not only the individual person, but how we interact with multiple people. So what we can see here at the Solar de Kesslan, it's not a residential apartment for one family, it's about the vision how to live together, for example, as students, and creating um, sustainable solutions that you would like to study not only one week, but a complete year or even for a complete master's time there, and thinking about the possibilities, how you interact in different environments for studying, for reading, for doing art, maybe for doing even music, for example. So this is very important to find the right light atmosphere and to have the respective variations there in the daylight. Thank you very much, Thomas. And I would like now to hand over again to you <laughs> for okay. going on with the program and the next uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we have the right topic now. The future is now. What should we expect from the future? We are confronted with the news that the construction industry is one of the largest CO2 emitters. And then we have light, we have interior spaces, and we need excellent alternatives. It can't be a compromise. We really need excellence in this way. So it would be interesting to know what we can learn from materials like clay, wood, or bamboo, or other material, mat, uh, materials, and where we don't have a lot of chemic, chemical protection around this. For this, we had the chance to um, get two experts, not from Wuppertal, but that we, are, we are very proud that they're coming from Cologne. We have Wiebke Schäfer and Moritz Zielker, and they work together in one their design studio. They don't only work together, when I'm informed in the right way, they live together, have a very happy relationship. I can see it on the face. And um, Wiepes has studied and comes with a background in fine arts from Denmark and then worked on architecture and interior design in Münster. And she has an own planning office, but I think it's much more interesting to collaborate with her husband on a daily uh, basis and exploring the, special, um, the ecological architecture and interior psychology, so I did some uh, doctoral studies and um, also about the perception and psychology, so I'm really looking forward to your contribution. And together they have established the office Studio W for Sustainable Interior Design and Ecological Architecture in Cologne. Then we will have Moritz Silker, and for the German audience it might be quite interesting because you know his face, 
but you would have thought not that he is coming up today here at the Solar Decathlon because some people watching TV and the Lindenstrasse know him that he has stood for many series uh, behind the camera or more in front of the camera, maybe giving some guidance for good lighting and for the right interior. He is a lecturer at the um, Appl Applied University in Dortmund and the studio which they have together are looking for organic um, hospitality for the hotel industry, also working on organic fair trade stores. So I think it will be very interesting to see what they contribute for private as well as commercial projects and how they work on living spaces and guide us to a new understanding for sustainability because the future is now and we have to start now to come up with new solutions. Please give a very warm welcome to Wiebke and Moritz. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. I think we grew <laughs> much older than I think this, that uh, <laughs> picture was about 10 years ago or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time ago, the picture. Yeah, thank you very much that we are so, here today. It's nice to have We're you here. Very honored. We wrote you a little story about ourselves, I think. You need this one. Okay. Need yeah, this one. Need it, this one. So, um, my amazing wife, to whom I've been married for exactly one year today, <laughs> it's our <laughs> wedding day today, our first wedding day. We know each other for 10 years now, but, or 11 no, or 12, for 20, 20 years. years. <laughs> we first started to work together and then uh, we decided to become a couple 10 years ago. So, it was a good decision. <laughs> the picture is older, by the way. <laughs> So we founded um, Studio W11 years ago. In the beginning, uh, our company was called Wiederverwandt, a German word that plays with the different uh, meanings like related again or reused, very complicated. And so uh, over elaborated that a new name had to be found. However, Studio W, uh, the basic ideas have remained. Uh, the idea of using resources sparingly, reusing building materials, and of, as often as possible, paying attention to longevity, celebrating traces of use instead of fighting them, and intensively discussing the sense and nonsense of adding new things to the earth. With every new project, we are just as careful about what we find in terms of structures and conditions, and also what the social impact is, whether it is in production, in use, or in, heavy, in habitation. So let's um, give you an overview of what we are working on. A few years ago, one of the most renowned uh, companies for um, fair trade, GEPA, GEPA, based here in Wuppertal, um, asked us to develop a design for furnishing systems of fair trade shops in uh, Germany known as Weltläden, or formerly Third World Shops. I think in other countries uh, there are such so uh, shops as well. Today's trendy fair trade movement would be unthinkable without the World Shops movement, uh, which began almost 50 years ago. And polishing up this uh, venerable institution was our task. It was clear to us uh, that we wanted to achieve as many sustainability goals as possible with this, with this design. For example, Germany's oldest workshop for people with uh, disabilities, Bethel near Bielefeld, uh, became the clo first close partner in the production of the WPS, the wooden pack system. The wood used in the components uh, manufactured in Bethel comes uh, from the Wood From Here initiative uh, and is grown in the local area of the workshops. As in all of our other projects, we wanted uh, the surface coatings to be as natural as possible, except for the powder coatings of the metal parts. The wood is treated with uh, clear, natural or pigmented oils. The WPS is now being manufactured in various workshops for people with disabilities uh, throughout Germany. The assembly and special installations are carried out by an ecological working carpentry shop near the city of Cologne, where we live and work. 
Yeah, another interesting thing. Um, we're currently dealing with a topic such as um, consolidation and possible different forms of communal living. The starting point was in uh, participation in the planning of a tiny house settlement as an extension and addition to a campsite uh, in Cologne. For this and some other projects, we have developed and built several tiny houses on wheels, as you see. Tiny housing, houses are certainly not the only solution to housing problems. First of all, due to the enormous land consumption, it is simply not possible to inhabit very many people or entire cities in tiny houses. But small mobile living units are a useful addition as flexible spaces of opportunities in growing settlements. As a kind of pioneer species, tiny houses can go ahead and enable the exploration of a new habitat. And they temporarily colonize fellow areas, flat roofs, and gaps between buildings. And this, if uh, they are built ecologically, without any major impact on the environment, because they function largely independently and are not firmly anchored to the ground. Tiny houses are also a test lab for optimal use of space and minimal living. The direct exchange with nature, the direct experience of the space uh, of the seasons enable uh, practice-based research, in a way, and reflection of what we really need to live. Yeah, and off it goes, I think. This is the workshop where we uh, build the tiny houses in, in uh, the city of Jülich, yeah, away. Three months later, I think. So, what is important? Um, no, just stop. Where is it? <laughs> this is uh, another tiny house we, we um, did for the uh, for the major insurance company R and V um, Insurance, which. Um, we visit several um, initiatives throughout Germany, um, as you see, and it traveled by now in four months, about 30,000 kilometers, and at the end of the tour it will be uh, gone just, I, I know, I think uh, one at 1.5 times around the world. Yeah. Yeah, another area of activity that we also consider important in general is the renovation and restoration of monuments. For example, an 18-year-old monastery in cooperation with Soan architect uh, architectures in, from Essen and Bochum, and an old water mill um, and many more in urban areas. What is important to us here is the careful handling of the existing, existing substance, the reading of the building and the transfer into a new phase of existence. We want to preserve the possibility of transformation and add a new chapter to the history of the place. Here we always want to combine new techniques and tradition, traditional building materials. So let's talk about a strong storyteller in the sphere of design, architecture, and beyond, the material itself. When was the last time you inherited a plastic table from your ancestors? <laughs> I guess never. I guess each of you has an old cherished piece of furniture and dish whose history can be seen and which becomes more valuable over time due to traces of aging. Materials like wood, leather, clay, metal, hemp, bamboo and many others, the um, uh, um, offer the opportunity to get connected with them because they are like us, natural born, closer to nature. The culture of quick, quick consumption and throwing away easily 
also arises from a disconnection with things, from a certain distance to them. What story does plastic offer me if there's a more beautiful, well-aging, honest alternative to it? What, what is the advantage of a PVC flooring when you can use linoleum? And two of you would voluntarily have a laminated floor installed if you can get a solid, solid wood plank floor. The industry leads us to believe that there is the longevity to these artificial materials that does not exist. Many artificial materials age awfully, I think you all agree. How simple is it to choose the natural alternative? It's even not more expensive if you buy just one table instead of three or four or five or six over the years. So, design is everywhere. According to the famous design philosopher Viktor Papanek, you can't not design anyway. Design is the conscious effort to create order in a meaningful way and is the basis of all human activity. But you can choose the medium to carry out design. When you choose building materials carefully and get in touch with a certain quality of each chosen material, reflecting its lifespan, its ability, ability to develop patina and traces of use, what will appear is a more conscious and mindful way of practicing design and architecture. Natural materials have something telling about them. They handle over information of its use and history, sometimes over generations. And they are open to receive new chapters. Easy to clean, coated materials, plastic, have a story of their own to tell. They often provoke a feeling of unease and give no answers. They are experienced as memoryless and having no history or face. Our relationship with these non-aging materials is functional. Natural appearances like traces of work, scratches, sweat, mud, even carrot peel, are denounced as dirt. Materials and design objects, same as building or entire cities, that have the ability to absorb and radiate the history of their use, offer us the opportunity to connect with them. The eternally new, immaculate, artificial, prevent this possibility of connection. Therefore, the permanence of architecture and urban planning must be valued and promoted. Buildings should be designed in such a way that transformation is possible. And now I'm handing over to my beautiful wife. Oh, God, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So now the future. What does the future of architecture hold? Well, the future is eco. It has to be. It's the only way for us to survive. If we continue as we are today, we shall not be able to honor our commitments to reduce 88% of the global emissions. Because the resources for concrete are limited. Everybody knows it's um, on media every day. So besides water, concrete is the most used material in the world. The construction industry is the largest CO2 emitters in the world. Globally, more than 4.6 billion tons of concrete are used every year. This production produces 2.8 billion tons of CO2. It's incredible. That is almost 8% of global emissions, more than air, tra tra air traffic and data centers together. <laughs> so, as architects, we are in charge to create the best houses possible to stop or even prevent the climate change. We have to take care, as architects, that our cities are prepared for hot summers, intense rainfalls and social insulation. And that means, you see, uh, urban, urban gardening 
it's also social projects everywhere. More plants on the roofs and more trees on the streets for much more fresher air and social living places all over the world. And now we come to the Sponge City. Sponge City indicates a particular type of city that does not act like an impermeable system, not allowing any water to filter through the ground, but more like a sponge. Actually absorbs the water rain, which is then naturally filtered by the soil and allowed to reach into the urban aquifers. What kind of material is the best to prepare for the future? And it's such a simple solution. It's so simple because it's one of the oldest building material on this earth. So <laughs> our son will clay. say, yeah, <laughs> clay. <laughs> First of all, clay. We love clay, we both. Nearly in every um, work can find clay. Clay has proven itself as a building material of thousands of years. Centuries old houses can be found all over the world that are still intact today. Um, Moritz showed the Columba and um, inside it's, uh, it's all of clay. It's very, very beautiful and the air is so fresh. Who the knows, who knows the Colum <laughs> Columba? <laughs> yeah. So clay has excellent properties. It has uh, wood preservation, moisture regulation, it's uh, vapor diffusible, it's heat insulation for the summers, it's the best to have clay on the walls. Um, it is soundproof, it's heat retaining and it's thermoregulating. <laughs> so clay also absorbs toxins from the environment and neutralize them. It's uh, nothing I, I know what it's like, like clay, natural. The second material, of course, it's wood. The advantage of wood are so diverse, but the most important thing is that it stores CO2 in the long term. And wood is the number one of renewable raw materials. Here you see the modular wood from shoot. And also very important, especially for the isolation of our houses, is straw. No other building material is so easy to build with, provides so much insulation for so little costs, or stores as much carbon within itself. It's so cheap that I don't understand why it isn't in every house straw. Because it's so cheap, I think. <laughs> Another advantage of straw bale buildings is their longevity. If they are designed and built well with appropriate materials and maintained throughout their lifetime, they should last more than 200 years. As Moritz mentioned, in the last years, we built tiny houses and we restored and renovated monuments and old buildings in an eco way with clay, with wood, with straw, with old fashioned bricks, with metal and so on. So, our logical conclusion now for our planning office is to design a modular way and of course only with ecological material. Here you, say, here you see um, also the workshop, not our workshop, but we are, we are working together. So for us, it's very clear that we will now mix all these ancient ways to build with all the new findings in technology. And because of the clay, wood and straw, it's now unavoidable to prefabricate modularity. Because the prefabrication has immense strategic benefits for us. It saves time at the building site and especially we are independent from the weather because clay as well as straw and maybe wood must be protected from kind of rain and frost damage. With modular design we are able to place our walls in a whole week or less 
less one week sometimes. But that's not all. Um, we have to do, to do more than using sustainable material. In the best way, the internal water system is a closed loop. On top of that, energy and heating system is powered by solar and solar heat and so many other things. We just show, uh, saw um, on Apple TV, it calls a uh, home or house or... Home, it's called home. 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 Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating series about um, ecological houses. It's so cool and there are so, so many inspiring people out there um, who are building so many great houses. It's goosebump, I told you. So, please, let us create completely energy self-sufficient houses. Like the thousands of them that have already been built all over the world. Here you can see the Naturhus in Sweden from family Solvam. It's also in this uh, series. It's scientifically proved that everybody who lives in an eco building close to nature processes, surrounded by some sustainable elements, will change his way of consumer behavior and will be more happy and content in life. Thank you. Dear Wiebke Moritz, thank you very much for this very nice, interesting story from Cologne. My first question was, did you have the chance to stay some nights and days in the tiny house? We had, we had the chance, yes. but... Uh, um, How was it from a normal apartment to a tiny house. Yeah, that's the qu question we always ask. If, if, if we <laughs> Do you also live, live in a tiny in a, in a house? Tiny house. No. Um, it's, yeah. it's a nice experience. It is building it and living in it. And it's, um, we built uh, um, a tiny house for a, a, a family of five, I think. I think. Yeah. And it's a very small place. And we, we stood there uh, um, at, at a time. And uh, it's a great experience. But it's, it's all, um, as we said, you, you have to minimize. And, and um, yeah, but the, the close, uh, the, you are closer to nature. And that is uh, the benefit of it. Yeah. I see. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Yes, Marianne, please. Do you have a microphone? Just a second, please. And we can hear you a little bit better. Firstly, thanks, you, thanks for an excellent presentation. Um, I was just curious, um, how do you get around the situation with fire? I mean, the German standards for construction are so tight with, with how do you create installation or what do you do with curtains? I mean, you can go with like, or, or systems like sun, sun shading systems. What kind of sun shading systems can you use in your buildings? I would in, love to know. Especially in the tiny houses. The tiny houses? houses? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's outside. It's only outside. Okay. Yeah. So you, have to, you have to put the Sonnensegel. Okay. But, but the tiny house uh, that, that you saw in the presentation has a double roof. It, yes. it, it stands in its own shadow. Uh -huh. So, in a way. Yeah, because yeah. I, I was just curious because mm -hmm. how could you create a variable situation for, for facades which are um, sun facing? And then the second part, like I said, back to the German construction and all mm -hmm. the rules. What's with the fire situation? Ich darf mal auf, ich muss yeah, auf Deutsch antworten. Natürlich. Genau. Also ähm, es ist für Privatleute, das heißt, wir haben keine, keine ähm, Auflagen in dem Sinne. Wenn es jetzt ein Hotelzimmer wäre, sähe das anders aus. Aber wenn es jetzt privat ist, ist es kein Problem. Ähm, außerdem sind es keine Häuser. Also sie dürfen nicht als ein Gebäude ähm, stehen oder verkauft werden. Es sind... Aufenthaltsräume zum Schlafen und ähm, wie jedes private, wie jede private ähm, Wohnung, obwohl wird sie überhaupt, ja, es ist, es ist eine Grauzone, rechtlich gesehen. Du musst einen Bauantrag stellen, um das Tiny House aufstellen zu können, also es ist on wheels, ähm, aber trotzdem ähm, gilt es nicht als Gebäude. In dem Moment. But, but we're but using regular building materials like, like yeah. insulation, like, like yeah. uh, um, wood fiber mm -hmm. um, and construction wood and, and uh, things like that. 
is all regular billing material that is proof that is uh, uh, fireproof uh, if, if it if it has to be. Yeah. yeah. So what do you do when you upscale then to a to a larger building? Mm -hmm. um, how? Like, I'm really interested in this because we, at our campus, we are trying to find ecological solutions. We're trying yeah. to move forward where the future is going. I mean, you guys are practicing. Mm -hmm. So um, what's the future then? How mm -hmm. can we upscale this to big buildings? How can we convince the German uh, standards and the, and the construction uh, ro uh, regulations that this is the way to go? That's no problem. Yeah. The, the straw, when it's uh, 60 uh, centimeters, um, it's no problem with the fire or, yeah. or the regulations. It's all um, nach DIN. It's yeah. no problem. We're working together with a workshop in, in Belgium. Mm. Um, they're building the, the straw and clay modules that are later on the construction site are, uh, are fi uh, fixed together. Um, and they have um, recommendations for, for Germany. Are, are they. Uh, it's it's mm. uh, from it's a German standard. Mm. So I'm also curious, how do you get the electrical cabling and everything? Like, I mean, have you integrated that in your modular, like like channels for 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 cables and for electrical, for all the stuff that has to be tucked away somewhere? Mm. In in this in yeah. the straw constructions, there, there's there uh, are Leerrohre. I don't know the English word. Uh, um, and the tiny houses have a special um, um, uh, um, uh, um, installation area yeah. in, in, the, in the wall. So yeah, because you, you can if freely, everything looks freely so perfect here, where mm. are the wires? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> what I wanted to know. Is that part that's of your That's in Sweden, by design? the way. It's they, not they, our they, tiny they, house. They, they, <laughs> un, un, underneath the, the, the plywood, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks, yeah. that was great. They yeah. don't need okay. electricity. <laughs> okay. Thank just you just fire. Just fire. <laughs> Yeah. So one question maybe, it would be interesting when you live in a partnership, how is it working together? Which strengths do you think Wiebke has in the best way and how do you complement for her? So can you just share two or three thoughts, what do you really appreciate about Wiebke's talents in the studio? I think I'm the more... What is she for you? Any? You are. No, you about her, what are her talents? Okay, you um, complete, uh, she completes me because um, oh. I'm just sometimes too, I'm, I look too narrow and then tiny, I just I see some, uh, some mice crawling around. Yeah. Or something. I'm, I'm, you, you help me not being too detailed. And yeah, vice versa, right. what yeah. really do you think about Moritz? How is he important for your daily work? Moritz is the detail. The detail, the detail and love for details. Yeah, I'm, I'm the fast one and he's the slow one. So, um, okay. We, yeah. we, we it are sounds like a perfect combination. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are often, we are it splitting. Is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It was great to have you here from Cologne and um, all the best for your future visions for sustainable architecture. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. We'll now shift to the panel discussion and Thomas Röhmheld will lead the discussion there and all the speakers who were there today will be asked to come here to the stage and um, Thomas Röhmheld will now lead a discussion about the question light and interior design and architecture, how we will approach this. So we'll just need a minute here to... Yeah, <clears throat> oh, it would be nice to have a second mic over there. Uh, you have? You? Okay, three, and I hand over. No problem. Uh, <laughs> okay, you, you are sharing the mic. And yeah, okay, so 
thank you, thank you very much for, for joining us here now again for the panel discussion. Um, we are skipping the break to have a little bit more time for this discussion. And uh, <clears throat> the title is that, uh, or the, the idea is that we are thinking what is the connection between light and architecture, interior architecture, um, maybe space design in general. And uh, the second question I would like to add is then, um, for us as educators, uh, what does it mean for education and for you as designers, or you also educator and designer, so what does it mean for education? Is it, um, yeah, yeah, what, let's stop it not going more into detail because it should be your discussion. So um, I would like to start with the um, connection between light and architecture, interior architecture, and I'm remembering the slide in your presentation where you were showing the facade with this uh, daylight reflection, so I read it like that, mm -hmm. on it, um, um, which leads me into the direction light and, or daylight and architecture. I think that wasn't, was the, um, are, is, is my headset still working? No, ah, okay. I think that was the Columba uh, yeah. um, Museum. Yeah. That was not a, not a reflection, it was um, the old um, uh, church that the museum was built on by Zumthor. Yeah. So, and that's not a reflection, but on the inside, it, uh, I think it's, uh, if you have ever been there, it is uh, such a brilliant experience, which when the daylight comes in through the little holes in the wall, ah, and you, okay. you experience um, a kind of uh, outside, but a very, in a meditative state, in a way, if you're inside that, that, uh, um, that building, where you see the, the several um, uh, um, century-old church relics on, on the ground. And um, we show that because it's, it's a growing city and which, which embraces all uh, its history. And, um, but it's a brilliant experience uh, um, of, of daylight and uh, inside, uh, as you in your, in your lectures uh, showed us already, how, how important that is. I think um, when I think about our colleagues in, back in Detmold, I mean, when we are discussing in faculty meetings, because we are a very big faculty with 35 professors, and um, one of these very big topics is, of course, sustainability. How do we move forward? How do we... I mean, we don't want to say the word sustainable. That must be what we do. And it was so exciting to hear your presentations today because I really feel this movement that we, I mean, you can discuss Fridays for Future as educators and also with, I think we, and also with Thomas, we are shifting. We are shifting into a new space, which, I mean, it's very exciting because that also in terms of interior architecture, new styles new styles for architecture, which previously, like I said, everything was grey. That was a style. That was a reflection of, I don't know, of, of production, of, of machines, of, of being somehow disconnected to your environment. And now I feel that we are heading again towards creating different kind of spaces. And I see that with the colleagues. All of my colleagues are going back to the basics. All of the colleagues are... We are going into the forest. We are having workshops in the forest. And I think workshops in the forest for us, especially here in Germany, is so important because our students, how can you have a campus and the people are disconnected with the forest? This is a geographical part of, of where we're at. And then the second part of that is look at the state of the forest. The forests in Germany like, I live directly in the forest underneath the, the, the very famous Hermann <laughs> statue, monument. And um, each day, like my partner can tell you, we see just truckloads of wood 
being shipped out of the forest daily, like ready to, in, already in shipping containers. The forest has been so greatly reduced, and I am so concerned. What do we do? And for us, like we also have at our campus, a big topic is um, reuse, not to rebuild. How do we deal with all this concrete? How can we, like you said, how can we make an addition to what already exists, which is, I don't like to use the word sustainable, but ecological. And I think this is the big challenge. And also to rethink about, I mean, when you think about curtains in, in, in lighting design, curtains and interior design, curtains were so passe for so many years because of this concept of facade being everything, being transparent, where you can see me, I can see you, the banks, they're doing everything okay. It's all transparent architecture. It's a culture of transparency re rooted back to this Protestant kind of thinking. It is, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> when we go back to this idea of curtains, I mean, curtains are coming back in. Curtains, the way that we con conceive curtains in terms of nature and how it protects us. And I think this is a really in important part that somehow we go back into the 70s, but with new digital tools, with new thinking, and with the lessons which we are learning now. I am optimistic, but I'm cautiously optimistic. And I have to be optimistic because I have children, yeah. and children. I'm teaching my students who are the next generation of designers. So this, I think, is a, um, really important that we have Barton Bach, that we have um, institutes, and also with you, that we have institutes which are really looking at daylighting, looking at sunlighting, and looking at all of us being responsible um, with regards to how we design and protect and preserve our environment and yeah. our way of life. <clears throat> I, I was just uh, mentioning, um, discussing with someone in the auditorium, uh, the point that a lot of these ideas, reusing, recycling, and so on, are ideas which we ha are discussing for a very long time. Mm. Now it seems to be, and I'm very optimistic like you are, um, now it seems to be that this gets a relevance which will maybe change more than we did, so my yeah. age, <laughs> we did during the last time. Judith, do you have the feeling that the importance of daylighting, of natural light, is now more uh, in architecture than it was some years ago? Mm. Yes, I think um, we rediscover it nowadays. But um, some years ago, we had really um, outstanding projects, and then um, we lost this approach. The momentum is a little, little bit lost. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, but I got conscious of the fact that we use a lot of aluminum in our mm. um, projects. We use also wood as a modulator in the skylights oh, because yeah. it changes the spectrum. Mm -hmm. The spectrum of the daylight gets warmer, yeah. but um, there must be other possibilities. There are invent new materials, light guiding materials, and this is what I take from the solar decathlon. Mm -hmm. This material approach, very impressive. Um, yes. The, the material approach is also something I think we can hand over to the producers. Uh, so as maybe someone who is working for ECHO, maybe you have an insight, what is the role of uh, using materials in lighting industry? Yes, so in the lighting industry, we are looking, of course, for best performance. And the question is really, in which way can we go when we see the upcoming regulations? Often there's the issue about repairability. And what does it mean for a manufacturer is that when this regulation is coming, you have to build a more stronger luminaire because the end user will start to repair it on its own. But this would mean that you have much more material, which needs to be much more robust if just a normal person comes in there to open and reopen it for a situation with LED lighting probably in 20 years. So the question is how much effort do we put into this issue of repairability 
or is it maybe much wiser to work on a system that could be updated in a specific way? Probably not by the end user because it will be too complex. So just imagine your smartphone, do it, do it on your own or think about your car which you have. You will probably bring it to a garage and so and the manufacturers might have the better infrastructure to update it than to give it to an end user where you would have uh, the challenge that you need to rebuild the function of opening and closing it in a proper way, in the right way. So those are the discussions which are currently going on when we see the regulations in the European Union about repair issues and then the question about uh, materials. In the moment where we go to other materials uh, the, and we really have to think when it's greenwashing, when we speak about biological plastics, if it's really very biological, the material itself and the gluing and some other issues, and what you do with luminaires, which are so organic that if you have them on the construction site and there will be some rain, they will dismantle in a, in a way because they are made to be recyclable and to dissolve in a way. So we have to make a difference between the decorative luminaires where we know probably they will have a definitely shorter lifetime than technical infrastructure. And so we have to rethink all the aspect, how many decoration we need. And if we take decorative luminaires, how do we build them that we're able to recycle them in a proper way or to reuse material in the, um, the appropriate uh, ways there? I just uh, wonder if there's more waste if you uh, throw more um, lighting away because of the LED inside technique nowadays. Because you, you had light bulbs or th something which you can easily uh, change, but you had, as, as a manufacturer, no control uh, about the, the, the light color and, and things like that. B because the consu consumers could uh, uh, change bulbs and, and, and Yes, and but things. in the yeah. moment when the mm -hmm. consumer do it without any knowledge, that's mm -hmm. tricky. But when we say that uh, technical upgrades will mm -hmm. be done by the manufacturer, it will be guaranteed that you'd have a better quality. If you mm -hmm. think about an update in 10 years, you will have a higher efficiency. Mm -hmm. The color rendition will be better. So those are not the pl uh, problems. And with the transition to the LED te technology, we see that you need to consume uh, less material because mm -hmm. we have the thermal management is different. It's on a much lower level. So we have less um, aluminum, for example, to dispatch the heat. We can work on optical polymers there. Uh, luminaires have become smaller. So by this transition, we are also able to minimize luminaires and mm -hmm. get at the same time more power out of them. Yeah, I'm sure you guys that I could uh, do a, a very good job there. But I think <laughs> many, many manufacturers, well, some cheaper manufacturers um, are are making uh, a lighting that will be thrown away. And this another yeah. story. You yeah. can work on standard modules there, which you exchange, but then you don't have a very high performance. This might be a compromise for decorative fixtures, but not for uh, technical lighting. Mm -hmm. Come, yeah. Okay. I, I think your topic today, and yeah. in terms of clay, <laughs> clay. I mean. There was like this movement like five years ago, eight years ago, ago for concrete lights. But what about if elements, I mean, clay is also a very good insulator and heat dissipator. Perhaps this could be something for Airco in terms of research um, area for natural. We also have our master's studios um, where we have the students are exploring materials um, for all sorts, natural materials for new applications. So maybe could this be something that we could see in the future with Airco? I think we are considering a lot of materials on mm. the market, but if you take clear, just think about the weight. That means for shipping, you have a much mm -hmm. heavier construction. Also the installation, installing it, it will be heavier. You need more materials instead of light ones. So you have to see it in a holistic way with mm. the different materials where you use materials in a specific I, way. I, but I was thinking about, sorry, just additive manufacturing processes with clay. So that means it decentralizes the idea of a manufacturer producing in Ludenscheid and having to ship order in China, having to ship to Australia, like, I, like for example, but instead that there are 
additive, like a, a shift in terms of thinking about, hey, the people in Australia could actually produce the lights in Australia through additive manufacturing processes, reducing cost for travel, deliveries, etc. I mean... But this is a severe um, production manufacturing challenge. Just yeah. imagine that you would like to buy a computer and say it should be done in Australia in the factory. We know that there's a company maybe in California and they have their production facilities somewhere in Asia, but just by the idea of sending, oh, you please erect a manufacturing site in Australia in the city, it's quite an effort to have the same quality standards and the same efficiency there. This is also uh, a question which you need to yeah, consider I, there. I, I think we should not go on, uh, go, go on discussing the problems of global production and the global network. I think um, we should go on uh, thinking about how light and architecture is connected and what we can learn from all these speeches and all the, all the, um, all the exhibits we have outside. Uh, could you say what would you think should be the future education for lighting designers or for light-related architects? <laughs> Oh, well, that's a difficult question. I don't know. I, I think um, Marianne would be... Um, no. Yeah, we, we are discussing yeah. this, but <laughs> the, I thought yeah. someone from outside. I think, I think it's um, the important thing is that you have a constantly um, view from the outside or from the outstanding that you see the whole thing not only um, the lighting process or the, the, the processes or the design that you see, um, yeah, the whole one, I, I don't know. Everything, yeah. the experience, the space, the... Thank you. The, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah it's just like, yeah, it's, it's, nothing is disconnected any, yeah, anymore. that's it. The head yeah. is connected to the body. Yeah, yeah? that's yeah. it. Yeah, I would also add that this holistic view is very very interesting and, and um, a need to talk about with the student that we are not talking about a technical thing, what yeah. we have to implement. We are not talking about luminous, we are talking about light and the relation to the humans and to the relation to the space. Mm -hmm. um, light is also something which has a social relevance mm -hmm. and um, there are a lot of different viewpoints um, on lighting. Um, what we try to, to do together with our students. And yeah, and I, and I think um, the mental health will be one of the most uh, interesting topics for mm. the next years. So um, the pandemic, um, all the, the uh, climate change, the war, all mm. this, and maybe you can... Um, and fear. And fear. Mm. You, you, uh, light gives us uh, such an important tool to, mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, to benefit. You did? You were also teaching? Yes, I uh, want to mention as a takeaway message, don't forget daylight, don't stop uh, building models, and um, daylight is free of charge, use it in your design process and it's one screw, Stellschraube of the atmosphere, the primary light, the natural light with its spectrum, intensity, dynamics, and then the surface is the other screw. And in combination, you create this overall atmosphere. And as a designer, you can convince the client and you can show your model and, yes. Yeah. From uh, working in debt mode, I mean, we have, a, we have the faculty, we, in our faculty we have um, urban planning, architecture and interior design. And I've seen like, um, a big shift with the connection between interior design and city planning, urban planning. And in terms of the, a change in the shift, I would say that urban planning needs a lot more to think about light as not just a, a tool to provide reflection on surfaces, but as a tool to provide the emotional needs 
for the people, the social aspects, uh, for the people in the public space, and vice versa. We can also learn from urban planning about movement, about the relationship between people, between spaces, between objects at a larger scale. And I think this is what's really exciting to see the breaking down of these very strict disciplines from the early 1900s into a more, um, more cooperation. Unity is the key. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you for, for this hint. I think urban planning, what we are also doing in, in our, let's say, third project we have in our education, it's also always an urban planning project to have exactly this as a viewpoint and to look more at the social function of lighting yeah. because the social processes are more obvious in the public space. But now, Thomas, uh, you are also teaching in an architecture faculty. What is your opinion about this connection uh, or the further approach for it's education. a matter of scale, so start to think in small steps, uh, building models so that you think first about is there's the daylight, there's the luminance, there's diffuse and directed light, and then we can scale it up a little bit more to start to combine daylight and electrical lighting, and then the next step is even to think about the user interface, how much can be controlled, and then also working just maybe on one building, one box, but then noticing what happens when we have a line of spaces and what can we do with this when we enter, for example, such a wonderful building like the Museum Columba in Cologne. It's a choreography of light and shadow and how this uh, um, starts from closed spaces to open spaces there. And this is yeah, rising up the complexity of the thinking. And finally, it's also the communication about light because we see it's wonderful to have many mood boards to see wonderful images, but the question is, how can you express this idea first to your professor, but later on to your client to make clear it's not only, a, it's the, not only the image, it's a contribution to energy efficiency, and that it also helps for yeah, the individual well-being there. And that's an uh, important step to think on the different scales there. Yeah, no, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, now I think we were coming much closer to the award ceremony, and I think this is a chance now for the people here on the on the stage to um, give maybe a comment or something uh, what you want to tell to the students sitting here in the audience, and maybe also to the students which are still not here but hopefully come in when we are talking about uh, the uh, awards. So would you have maybe a closing word to the students and then we can go through also the mm -hmm. group? Yeah, um, learn to explain, or I would say to my students, learn to explain why you're doing this and that. As you, have, you have to uh, um, learn the, all the, uh, um, the, the, the skills uh, in lighting, in, in room building, in urban planning, and, and, but you have to um, explain it and then you have to re reflect why you're doing something and not the other way, and this way. And then you have to be very focused and clear. So that's all you have to do. <laughs> okay, and please. Yes, begin with the human being and its needs in your project. And not with the system or the solution. And yes, that's the most important. And consider daylight, it's the ideal light source integrated into your project. I think we're in a very, very exciting time at the moment, besides the war, besides the, um, or probably because of the war, because of corona, we're in an exciting time because we have to, everything which we've imagined, we have to really push forward to a new future, a new possibility. We cannot continue to destroy the planet and destroy the way, like mental health, um, ourselves, our friends, our environment. We really need to turn the way that we think and also to trust yourself. Trust yourself. Trust what you know. You already know so much. 
You have a whole life already behind you, full of experience. I speak to you, Yuri. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these are the, and all the students who are here, you already know so much. So every moment is a moment to observe. Every moment is a moment to re-look at, to look the other way. Why is it this way? And to reflect not only on what a project is, but what does it mean to you? What does it mean to the people around you? And that's my last word is unity, that we trust ourselves but work together. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, I think it's simple. Love what you do, and then everything follows. Okay, yeah. thank you. And Thomas? Think about effectiveness. Don't fall in love with efficient technology too fast, like I told you. Think about the global image, what should be done first. Think about the sunlight, then about the interface, what you can do additionally, and that's it. Think about the effectiveness of the way design has played a crucial role. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and from you, Thomas, what's your last words? From, from my side, I would say, yeah, trust yourself and keep your eyes open. Nice. Thank you. Okay, now I think we have a break. And uh, around in 15 minutes, I think then we will go on with the award ceremony. And maybe you can tell the teams who are interested in getting a prize <laughs> that they should come. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs>
Darling, you gotta let me know Should I stay or should I go? If you say that you are mine I'll be here till the end of time
Yesterday, I had just a very small glimpse about the party capacity that you have. I hope you're all feeling good today. Welcome to this afternoon and the two out of competition awards. The whole day has been created and designed by the two associations together. The Association of German Interior Architects and the German Lighting Society, which is why both associations will award the teams in a parallel manner to symbolize the partnership. And on behalf of the two associations, I'd like to announce one of the marketing partners to me on stage, Mr. Thomas Beckmann. Is on? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, hello, welcome, uh, people. I'm Thomas Böckmann, I'm an industrial designer um, working for Spahn Wood Products for a lasting sheet collection called um, Rich Light. So it has nothing to do with light. But we have a project here at the University of uh, Düsseldorf. The students built two kitchens with our material, and as I said, is a lasting material. So if you like to see, please visit their building, and if you like to have information, please contact me this evening or go to our website. And uh, many greetings to all the participants here, and uh, of course, many congratulations to the coming winners. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening. Mr. Beckmann, thank you very much. Two associations, two partners, that absolutely makes sense, which is why I welcome on stage the next partner, Herr Thomas Müller. Yeah, this part got a little bit more, is a little bit more related to lighting than the colleague before. So, um, yeah, dear Solar Decathlon participants, uh, dear jurors, dear Professor Rimhild, where is he? Over there. <laughs> dear guests, uh, on behalf of the companies LTS, Atelier Lichtan, and uh, We have Leuchten, and the entire Fargold Group, I'm pleasured to be welcome you here in Wuppertal for the awarding of the LED Prize for Sustainable Architectural Lighting as part of the Solar Decathlon 21 and 22. For the first time in its history, the Solar Decathlon is taking place in Germany. So I'm very pleased that so many young people have come here today to present their visions of a sustainable future of sustainable architecture. Yes, and actually we have difficult times marked by crisis and bad news. But the Solar Decathlon is a really positive beacon with a very positive um, influence, sending out a signal which is very good and which is very important. This is a competition. This is about developing ideas and implementing them, about making things happen, where the international university teams make their concept tangible and visible. I would like to sincerely thank all participants for their creative and their intelligent contributions. We are here today to celebrate a special element of architectural light. For the first time, a project participating in the Solar Decathlon will, be, will receive an award for the best and the most sustainable lighting solution. The prize for sustainable architectural lighting awarded by the Deutsche Lichttechnische Gesellschaft. I do not know the real translation into English, so sorry for this. And chosen by a distinguished jury, who I would like to thank you very much for their work. So I'm just as excited as you to see which team wins the award. What one thing is for sure, that there are only winners here today. Because it is thanks to your commitment to sustainable architecture 
that we all gain future quality of life. On behalf of LTS, Atelier Lüktan, VF Leuchten, and our parent company, the Fagerholt Group, I would like to say how pleased we are to be able to be a sponsor for an event like this. But it goes without saying that just sponsoring an event like this, the, event, uh, the lighting industry must take more action to implement sustainable things than just simply sponsoring events. So lighting may not be the largest factor when it comes to calculating environmental footprints of buildings, but light is visible and creates visibility. It influences our perception, our emotions, and our biology. It plays a decisive role in whether we feel comfortable in an architectural design surroundings or not. We embrace the responsibility that this gives suppliers of high quality lighting solution. Let me give you a few examples to demonstrate how we are at VF Leuchten, for example, are paving the way to sustainability. So for sure, this starts with a clear commitment of the company, not only us, but the entire Fagerholt group, to sustainability as a part of the corporate mission. Then this decision must be translated into action. And luckily for us, as a family founded business more than 70 years ago, thinking and acting sustainability are built into the DNA of WF Leuchten. Our products are energy efficient, durable, maintenance friendly, and are featuring a modular design. They are made of recyclable materials, and we have implemented a certified environmental management system. And now we are reorganizing the production, administration, and logistics on a long-term basis to reduce our environmental impact. All this is important, but everybody knows it's during their use that luminaires have the greatest impact on their environment. Needless to say, through their energy consumption, but especially in the way that light directly affects people and nature. This is why we have an ambitious target. Together with you, the future architects of our living environment, we want to shape a paradigm shift towards a greater awareness of the way that light is used at night. All of us here today probably agree that the principle of just more and more, for example, of light in outdoor applications, it's not a sustainable strategy. On the contrary, it jeopardizes the ecological foundations of life. A new way of thinking about lighting looks at the whole picture, people's actual visual needs and also the biological effect on light to us, the effect on the night sky, on animals and on plants. We are looking for a new balance for these th complex relationships. So we need change processes and lighting concept. These in turn make new demands on technologies and luminaires. As a luminaire manufacturer, we want to offer you, the planners of the futures, customized tools for the conscious use of light at night. And we have found a term that guides our developments, and we call it night-sensitive lighting. What does it mean? For example, that we already offered many luminaires which are certified following the dark sky regulations in many, many countries. So this means that such street lights and uh, bollards are designed so that they do not emit stray light into the night sky. Or luminaires to highlight buildings and make them stand out in the urban landscape. Here projectors with so-called gobos can ensure the sharp illumination of the building contours only, without light scattering. We have one of the most extensive ranges of such projectors for this kind of use in outdoor areas. And a further issue is the color temperature. Current researches indicate that the warmer the color of outdoor lighting is, the less insects and other animals are negatively affected by it. So it goes without saying that we offer LED modules in warm colors for luminaires.
But that's not all. We have developed an adaptive technology for street lights, which we call wild light. These luminaires can produce light in different color temperatures. Very warm toned, continuous light that is very kind to nature, with an additional, somewhat cooler component added only when motion detects human activity. This provides more brightness and better coloring, color rendering when needed. So light is becoming increasingly intelligent. We equipped luminaires with the digital control sensors and communication modules, so the light senses when it's needed. This saves energy and reduced the impact of light on nature. And these are just a few examples of how the Fargold Group are, is working on sustainable lighting solutions. And I think the, third, the lighting industry certainly has the technical expertise to become more sustainable. But above all, respect for the night and its nature, it's needed to embark on paths to the sustainable future together with you, the creative planners and users. So I would like to sincerely wish you all good luck and success on this part, path. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the event and have a good party afterwards. Thank you, Thomas Müller. We're here for both awards alike, the Human-Centered Interior Architecture Award and the Sustainable Architectural Lighting Award. Both of the awards, of course, do have their own juries, consisting of five jurors each. We do have three prizes per award, so we do have fewer than the five jurors on stage later on. But in order to have an impression of the five jurors for the Human Centered Interior Architecture Award, these are the first five. And for the Sustainable Architectural Lighting Award, there's another jury of five members. Both awards will be given in a parallel manner. And in order to announce the two third places of both awards, I welcome on stage the first jury member, Markus Braun, on behalf of the BDER. Welcome. And Professor Dr. Thomas Röhmhild, the chairman of the LETG. A lot of Thomases tonight. Enjoy. So, third place. We award the third prize for work that is characterized by a particularly good overall presentation. The well thought out details and the integration of innovative technology as well as the perfection of the presentation are convincing. The third prize goes to the University of Stuttgart.
the, <coughs> the Sustainable Architecture Lighting Away, uh, <laughs> Award um, of the German Lighting Society is being awarded for the first time this year. The LETG tries to define the term sustainability for lighting and to put it into practice. In architecture too, a future worth living in is based on the successful combination of natural and artificial light with reduced energy consumption. With the award for sustainability architecture lighting, the German Society of Lighting honors innovative lighting solutions that combine technical design, energy and social aspects. Dealing with daylight was very important for the jury. Does the offer of daylight correspond to the needs to the, of the users? Is the concept of daylighting innovative? It wasn't the measured values that were decisive, but the atmosphere, the way in which architecture and daylight become new room concepts. For the jury, sustainability in the use of artificial light is not only measured by the economical use of energy, but also by the fact that the light can be flexible, flexibly adapted to the different usage scenarios and supports the effect of the architecture. The third prize, precision and innovation inspired the jury. Through the use of innovative materials, such as a combination of vacuum and argon glazing, it is possible to combine high energy efficiency with good daylight transmission and an even supply of daylight and an excellent view of the outside through a large glass front in the living area. Window sizes adapted to the use and user-friendly building automation enables sufficient daylight supply. This includes adequate and demand controlled shading in order to increase the saving of electricity for artificial lighting in addition to passive solar gains. Pending light sources with adjustable light distribution and luminaires are oriented towards high quality visual tasks in the living, cooking and dining areas. In order to determine the position for built-in surface mounted and pendant lights, various floor plans and furnishing variants were examined. At these points, a self-developed mounting box is firmly integrated into the ceiling, which can then be activated by the user if necessary. Outside, the design motive of the light lines runs through all handrails of stairs and ramps and mounted on the surrounding walls. Also on the greenhouse area, the light line is supplemented by battery buffered portable lights for individual lighting of the roof terrace. The third prize goes to Level Up Rosenheim. Thank you very much, Markus Baum and Thomas Rohmhild. Congratulations to the teams for the third places. Coming to the second places on behalf of the BDER, I welcome on stage, do you remember, Jutta Hillen, and on behalf of the LETG, Paula Longardi, who's also a jury member and a lighting designer. Welcome on stage.
Good evening. Uh, very important to say that all teams were, uh, the designs were really of a very high quality and uh, it was amazing. Thank you. We award the second prize to work with a particularly sustainable, spatially structural concept that focuses on the best possible user flexibility and the economical use of resources. So, the second place goes to Team Virtue Eindhoven. Okay, and I, I have the pleasure to um, award second prize for sustainable lighting design. I'll have some things to read, so bear with me. Second prize, play with space and light characterize the architecture. A sophisticated second shell surrounds the building, allowing daylight to play with the architecture. A light flooded intermediate space is characterized by rhombus-shaped PV elements in the upper area and becomes a green wall in the lower area by creepers, which define a private area in front of the apartments. This access gallery fascinates with its play of shadows and together with overhanging surf uh, surfaces, provide sun protection so that no further additional sun protection is necessary. The outdoor lighting concept with linear lighting keeps light pollution to minimum. For the interior lighting, a system was developed in which all cables are laid on the surface in order to save material and space for the installation level on the one hand and react flexibly um, to new room uses or requirements and to simplify maintenance and work and minimize the deconstruction process on the other hand. The DC tape system was developed for the project to enable lay people to easily and flexibly install lights. This innovative surface mounted installation consists of a thin conductor strip made of zinc that can be glued to ceilings and walls. Luminaires can then be flexibly plugged into the DC tape by the user. In this way, the lighting can be individually adapted to their needs. The selected luminaires and their arrangement demonstrate that good solutions are possible. In general, the artificial light is well soaked. For example, the variable walls are deliberately illuminated. The lighting concept of the kitchen and the bathroom is oriented to adapt to users' daily routine. In the bathroom, a light ceiling can be used to create a light shower that revitalizes the body in the morning hours and in the evening by changing the color temperature and illuminance helps to calm down. Light shower is easy to use and with useful light scenes. I guess you all know already. The second prize um, goes to CoLab Stuttgart. <laughs>
Congratulations to the teams. Okay, then not. You don't have to. You're good. <laughs> and in order to announce the first place of the Human Centered Interior Architecture Award on behalf of the BDR, I welcome on stage, do you remember Daniela Sachs Reumann? In order to announce the winner of the Sustainable Architectural Lighting Award on behalf of the LETG, I welcome back on stage Thomas Rümmelt. <laughs> Good afternoon, Wuppertal. Hello. <laughs> I'm really excited to present this prize and it's a very nice work which convinced us and which, which has a particularly inviting atmosphere. We, at, at the same moment when we entered this place, we were at ease. The variable concept of use and the high degree of authenticity create a positive enabling space that gives the user the opportunity for personal appropriation to the highest degree. A university that has not yet been on the focus of awards in this competition can be particularly pleased with this first place. Gratulalong, bitch! <laughs> The winner of the Sustainable Architectural Lighting Award convinced the jury by a daylighting concept using facade and roof and in this way illuminating the, roofs, the rooms very evenly, even in the depths of the rooms. Unwanted entry of light is reduced by a fixed shading system and additional flexible sun protection. A special aspect of sustainability is the concept of reusing windows. The artificial lighting is characterized by flexibility. In this case, the light is takeaway and thus the illumination of unused areas with artificial light is reduced.
indirect lighting was installed for general lighting, which pleasantly distributes the light in the rooms thanks to the bright surfaces of the walls and ceiling. Lighting and acoustics go hand in hand. The linear lighting in the kitchen and in the bathroom is well shaded and gives a pleasant atmosphere. The lighting concept works both in the house demonstration unit and in the overall concept. The general focus on sustainability in this project includes sustainability in daylighting and artificial lighting. The lighting project implements circular economy values combining state-of-the-art LED lighting technologies and innovative user-oriented lighting design. The first prize goes to Roofkit Karlsruhe. Congratulations to the winning teams of the Human Centered Interior Architecture Award and the Sustainable Architectural Lighting Award of the Solar Decathlon Europe 2021 2022 in Wuppertal. <laughs> teams! <laughs> Tomorrow's gonna be the next and last award show. So I hope we see each, o each other again, every one of you, tomorrow at 3 p.m. for the People's Choice Awards. Have a great afternoon, see you tomorrow. Yeah.